Can you tell the audience? Can you, oh, there. Okay. Perfect. Okay, everybody, we got about 30 seconds. Five seconds. All right, good evening everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is the Monday, September 20th, 2021, regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. Um, before we get going, I would ask that uh, all of you please turn your cell phones to silent or vibrate and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. It sounded great. It's nice to have so many people with us. Okay, Mr. Roush, could you please take attendance? Here. seven. All right, getting right into our consent agenda, we have item 2.1 is the approval of the minutes from August 16, 2021 regular meeting. Uh, 2.2 is a list of staff who have now announced their resignation along with the effective dates. Uh, 2.3 is a list of teachers recommended for employment for the 2021-22 school year. Item 2.4 is the July and August financials uh, will not be available for approval until the Board of Education, until the October board meeting, so that's not going to be on there. Uh, 2.5 is uh, approval requested to authorize legal payments to the Thrum Law Firm in the amount of $318 uh, August 26, 2021 for professional legal fees. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, support by Mr. Rausch. Any discussion regarding items 2.1 through 2.5? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, that brings us to presentations to the board. Item 3.1 is the presentation of 2021-2022 employee awards. Mr. Sherrill. Yes, so for, for a number of years now, um, we have been giving out these awards and we thank the Gerstacker family and the foundation for supporting these awards. Um, our first is this, <coughs> excuse me, the Distinguished Service Award. It is modeled after the Gerstacker Teacher Proficiency Award and was first awarded in 2002. We'd like to, and we've already honored these people, but we'd like to honor them again tonight at our board meeting. And our, um, not our, our recognition goes to Dennis Decker, paraprofessional at Central Park Elementary School, Brett Seamster, office professional at Central Park Elementary School, Joni Wing, administrative assistant at Plymouth Elementary School, and Tammy Brown, administrative assistant at Northeast Mi Middle School. And along with that, the, Gerstacker Teacher Proficiency Awards were also honored at our opening day. Uh, Mr. Lauterbach is our board representative on that group. Um, the Gerstacker Award winners were Court Terry Flory, special ed teacher at Adams Elementary School, Jeff Yoder, chemistry teacher at Midland High School, Jamie Swanson, English teacher at Northeast Middle School, and Pam Taylor, third grade teacher at Plymouth Elementary School. Congratulations to our award winners. And 3.2, the Shining Stars. Yes, yeah, so our Shining Star, um, a little different this time. We usually do a teacher and a support staff. Um, I'll read a little bit why this one's a little different than, than the past that we've done. Uh, the Midland Public Schools Transportation Department is made up of more than 40 staff members dedicated to ensuring Midland community students get to and from school safely each and every day, as well as to and from special events. However, Tuesday, September 7th, was an extraordinary, extraordinary day for our transportation team. Kudos to our transportation managers, Vicki and Angie, as well as our bus drivers and paraprofessionals who chartered the tornado warning and sirens issued at approximately 3 p.m. Our middle school and high school students were already on buses making their way home. 
With a moment's notice and with coordination by the transportation managers, the bus drivers diverted their traditional route and made their way to an MPS school or a building to shelter with students to wait <coughs> and be all clear. Once the secondary students had been delivered home, our stalwart bus drivers and paraposts went back to school to pick up their elementary students. Needless to say, some of these little ones were visibly upset by the severe weather. This team's quick thinking, cool heads, and empathetic hearts got all of the bus riding students home safe and sound on this extraordinary day as they do 180 days, school days a year. Congratulations to our transportation department. All right, that'll bring us to a presentation of summer programming. We have Allison Cicinelli, and we have Dr. Steve Poole, and we have Jen Servas. All right, thank you. My name is Allison Cicinelli. I'm here with Jen Servas and Steve Poole from the curriculum department, and we're here to talk with you about our summer learning program. As with all of our programs here at Inland Public Schools, our summer learning program we have designed in a way to align with our vision. Our vision uh, is focused on enabling all of our students to achieve success, and that was really how we looked at the design of our summer learning program. For our presentation tonight, we're going to provide a brief overview of a high-level summary of what we've covered in both the elementary, middle school, and high school level. For the summer learning program, we delivered uh, instruction through multiple modes of learning. We provided both face-to-face -face and a virtual learning environment. As you saw earlier with our shining stars, we had transportation available for our students, and breakfast and lunch were served daily. The funding for our summer learning program was mostly paid for out of federal funds. Title I primarily supported Central Park and Plymouth, and the majority of our other schools were supported through other federal funding sources. Section 23B was from the federal government and it flowed through the state of Michigan, and ESSER funds also supported the majority of our programming. The ESSER stands for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, and we're also from a local support position. We're happy to say that we received from the Midland Lions Club $5,000 for high interest books at both the elementary and middle school level. So starting with um, elementary summer learning, we had 348 students participate in programming this summer. 55 elementary teachers and 25 paraprofessionals. We had five what we call programmatic functional support specialists uh, that really helped to get all of the programs at the buildings up and running. They supported uh, daily attendance and also supported payroll. Uh, students were identified as needing additional support in language arts and in math and we used data from NWEA and IRIP information, individual reading improvement plans, um, to invite students. We had a few different learning models. We had individual and small group tutoring that was held both in person and virtually. And we had a traditional model um, with small groups of students that attended at Central Park and Plymouth. Our overall attendance rate for elementary, 87% of students attended. Approximately $342,000 was spent to run the elementary summer school programming. And we did ask for feedback from our teachers and a few to highlight for you and share. Um, the first one had to do with uh, the tutoring model. The teacher felt that it went really well. Uh, this teacher tutored five students in a one-on-one -on -one approach, and students made significant progress. Parents were very happy to see the progress and also really engaged with the teacher so that they could find out how to further support their students at home beyond the summer experience. 
And then the second comment was reflective of um, an in-person program at Central Park, that it was incredible. Students and families loved the times and the short weeks, gave them some flexibility to also enjoy some of their summer. And our um, PSFS had everything set up perfectly so that things ran smoothly from day one. And on to middle school. At the middle school, our programming supported 72 students. We also had 16 teachers and one programmatical function support specialist. The focus for our summer learning for the middle school program was on math and literacy. We had 16 students participate in our literacy program and supported 56 students in math. Students were invited based on criteria, multiple points of criteria. We used NWEA, non-complete, course ease, and teacher recommendations to uh, create our invitation list for summer school for middle school. The middle school supported two learning models. The first one is face-to-face -face where we utilized our MPS teachers where 58 of our students attended a four-week program from July 12th to August 6th. The program was three hours a day. Groups were in small groups, so individualized and small group instruction was supported. The second program we offered was a virtual opportunity from Boost Edgenuity. It's a little bit different of a program than the Edgenuity that was run throughout the, throughout the remainder of the school year. This was an eight-week program where students took a pretest to determine uh, individualized pathways to support student learning in both math and literacy. That program ran from June 14th to August 13th, and an MPS teacher was available to support, check in, and uh, support students through tutoring if needed. Attendance overall for the middle school program was 72%. The overall cost for the middle school program was 88,000. And uh, we did receive some great feedback from both some of our students and our staff. When students were asked if you would do this again, uh, we, we gathered several responses and the majority of them were primarily pretty positive. One student said, yes, it was really fun and I also got a free book every time. That's kind of a shout out to our Midland Lions Club the support that they provided us, we really appreciate. All students who attended the middle school program did receive a book. And another student said, yes, uh, I, would, I would love to come. It would help me pass in school because it was fun to do. And then just to highlight the last sentence, I was with others who needed help to do so I didn't feel alone. When we think about the past year and how many of our students felt alone, the overall experience from summer school in talking with many of our teachers, they felt that it was a real positive experience by helping connect with students in a different way. So while we look at a lot of our academic um, metrics for the support of the summer school program, one of the things that we really wanted to highlight was the feeling of connection that many of our students felt during this experience that they expressed uh, looked different and felt different than they had in, in quite a while given the past year with COVID. So I'm gonna pause for a second and give you the opportunity to read one of the pieces of feedback that a teacher provided when they were asked the question, what can you tell us about the summer experience? What did families say? So I'm gonna pause and give you the chance for you to listen. Just to lift out a couple of the comments, truly impacted not only students' learning, but their confidence. Mm -hmm. Their confidence that was built, ability to start conversations and make friends had increased, one-on-one -on -one support, increased student engagement, and saw his confidence build. Over the course of the year, we know that COVID has taken a toll on many of our students, and the impact that our summer learning program has provided for some of our students who needed the most support overall has shown quite a bit of success. Many of the conversations that we've had with teachers really resemble the remarks that you see on the screen. This wasn't the only comment. A lot of conversations um, have really supported this whole mindset of students really felt the deep connection in the small groups for the program that was created this summer. On to high school. 
private schools uh, focus on credit recovery. So in high school, you either get credit or you do not get credit. And obviously, we had a lot of students that um, did not do very well first semester last year uh, when they were virtual. And we were able to bring those students back in second semester uh, to make sure that they were able to get credit. Uh, but they were still behind in credit. So this summer school really did help uh, a lot of those people who, who chose to be home uh, first semester. The MHS uh, program ran June 14th through July 9th. Um, they had a morning and an afternoon session. And uh, it did go over a little bit past July 9th. And I'm guessing that the Dow High did one as, uh, went over as well. They were from July 12th through August 5th. Why would it go over a little bit? Because we wanted to make sure as many students as possible could get credit. So there were students that were working in those courses. Maybe they had another unit to do. Um, we would allow them to continue uh, to work with the credit. We had 182 students total for high school, uh, 24 teachers, two programmatic uh, functional support specialists, and three paraprofessionals. Uh, it was also an emphasis on math and ELA uh, district-wide, as we talked about with elementary uh, and middle school as well. But we also had uh, some social studies and science in there, so our percentages are pretty good. Um, for math, 78%, ELA, 84% that are in credit, social studies, 91%, and in science, 89%. So very uh, good numbers of success when it comes to earning credit in the classes. Achievement, 83%. So 286 of 346 uh, attempted credits, attempted were earned. So that's a, that's a great percentage uh, to have students that started a class and that, that number uh, achieved credit. Numerous stu students earned more than one credit during the summer school. Uh, one, there was 11 students who earned two credits, uh, which is four classes uh, during summer school. So 11 students really, <laughs> really uh, worked hard in summer school to get credits and catch up. And again, in high school, you don't just move from ninth grade to 10th grade. You have to have a number of credits to move to that next grade level. So a lot of them were able to move to from ninth grade to 10th grade because they made up credits in summer school. Cost approximately $225,000 to run the high school uh, summer school program. We also asked for feedback. Uh, these are from teachers. Students were engaged and happy to have the opportunity to earn credit. And I really like this last one. They seemed motivated and internally fulfilled when completing assignments. They knew that they had screwed up and didn't get credit the first time around. They wanted to make sure that they earned credit, so it was something that was internal as well. And that ties into what Allison was talking about, about students feeling better about themselves. And there's a big shout out to transportation. <laughs> it's funny that uh, they just won the shining star, but uh, Vicki and Angie at transportation were amazing. Tina Malzahn and Chartwells, um, they received breakfast and lunch every day. Um, I also want to make sure that I thank our principals and our counselors because they had to recommend the, the students for this program. Um, and even our teachers uh, from high school to middle school all the way down to elementary because they were able to identify the students that needed help as well. Questions might you have? And of course, you can ask Jen and Allison as well. I don't have a question, uh, more of a, I guess, a comment. Um, this was a, I think, a wildly successful program. It was very well run, and I know that because my son participated in the middle school boost, math boost program, and he went, in, went into it coming out of seventh grade. Um, I think he was more afraid of math than he just didn't conceptually get it. And, and having gone through the program, um, he is thriving in his math class in eighth grade. He loves math, and he just understands it more. And he, I, I've seen him grow so much over the summer uh, just from a, a personal growth and accountability standpoint of, of him knowing that every day, Monday through Thursday, he's got to log on and, and get this work done. And even though it was summertime and all his friends were out playing, he took that responsibility and he did it, and he was successful at it. Uh, so I just want to commend you all for, for a very, very well-run program um, by all measures. So thank you for that. forever ago, um, I would get 
asked to do summer school every year, and it was econ and government were the ones that were really pushed at that time. Um, we do not have a lot of students that sign up for summer school until this year. I would say, I'm guessing here, I'm guessing maybe a dozen to two dozen at most um, that we would have in high school, and it's normally either to get ahead in credits or it's even taking a class to, to make up credits, but it's not that many students. I just want to add uh, to a testament to our teachers. You know, they're coming off probably one of the most exhausting years. Uh, it was impressive to see them really step up, as well as our principals and everyone to support, mm -hmm. making sure that we could best meet student needs. Um, since I've been here at the secondary level, with the exception of a couple of the high school programs that Keith has highlighted, we haven't offered a middle school program for, for summer school. And so this is the first time, or this is my fourth year, that we've had a program, at least in recent years. I think uh, years ago there used to be different programs that we, we did offer. And I think from elementary perspective, um, as you know, we've offered elementary summer school for years. Um, in, in four years, it was much more of a traditional model where we did have a lot of options um, this year for students to engage, whether it was in person or virtually, whether it was small group or one-on-one, -on -one, or a more traditional model. So I think all of those options really gave um, families choice um, and they were able to, you know, choose the one that worked best for them so that many more students could participate. Maybe one more question. Did we track the NWEA after the summer school or will we be getting those results in the fall? That's a great question. Um, we were hoping to have the NWEA results to be able to use as a part of this uh, presentation, but we did have to extend the, week, the window uh, an okay. extra week due to some of the students not being able to attend. Okay. So we're hoping to have those results aggregated over the next couple of weeks for us. So quick numbers here, 635 colleges. Um, what portion of that is 1A after 1, after 2? What was the uh, cost of the certificate of that specific one? Any sense? Yeah, Brian will get into the detail of that, Brad. But we did start this plan well before ESSER dollars were even um, available or announced, and so we were going to commit to our general fund no matter what we were doing to learning loss. It's something we, uh, I've been pushing for a while is to get a robust summer program at all levels, and I think what, you know, what we learned, we'll continue to do so, but Brian can tell you the dollars break out better. Yeah, sure. I, I will double down on what Mr. Sherrill just said. When we planned, we didn't know what funding source we were going to utilize. The state actually came out with a funding source called 23B, which you saw in that presentation. Um, and those funds to pay us retroactively for our costs just became available last week. We don't know the full amount of our allocation right now because it was application based and it was prorated across the state based on the number of students in the state that participate in the larger pool. But we're anticipating that we might be somewhere near Brad, 95 to 100 percent of those costs being covered by 23B. If there were remainder costs, our plan right now is to shift those to ESSER 2B dollars. ESSER 2B, the second portion of it, we believe, because of something called the Tidings Amendment, we'll have two fiscal years to be able to spend the remainder of those dollars coming this year, both this and one more, and ESSER 3, which we have not yet applied for yet, that application just opened up a week and a half back and is due in December, will be, in our opinion, open for two guaranteed years, possibly a third, considering if the Tidings Amendment is in play. So this year, a following, and possibly one more. So we have maybe not 100 percent, but a pretty good percentage of all of our expenses will be covered for the next couple of months. I, I believe I don't want to speak out of turn for Mr. Sherrill, but I believe it's our intention to run a very, very robust summer school for the next foreseeable future. Fantastic. So it seems like we have uh, ten minutes left for some tax savings. I don't know why I didn't add that. Was it seven? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, when we're all done with the investor funds, we have um, several strategies in place from student support to uh, mental health to summer school, learning cost gap. When we're done, you know, we're going to have some data and we'll probably have some tough decisions to make when the ESSER funds are gone and, and what's our best bang for the bucks and what should go in the general fund going forward. And again, I, I've been a big believer in both Brian and I came from districts that have very successful summer programs. And so we've pushed for a while, as Steve said, it, at one time it was more credit advancement than credit recovery at the high school. And I think it's a change in mindset here. And uh, they did a great job getting it off and going this year. So I think, I think you're right. I think we're going to have to continue to look at it. schools, the programs were run a little bit differently uh, between the different buildings. The principals really headed up, uh, so Sheila and Dirk uh, were the two that really took charge and did a nice job setting it up. Um, when Sheila transferred to Midland High, Shannon was the one that actually implemented it, but um, there was a lot of collaboration behind the scenes, a lot of teamwork to really pull off a successful program. So a lot of hands on deck. Our programmatic function support specialist worked between both of the buildings, and there was also coordination with both of the high school principals because of all of the renovations in the summer. So the programs were actually located at Midland High and Dow High. So Jefferson students attended at Dow High, uh, and then um, Northeast students attended at Midland High. Okay. Some of that was construction related. Okay, and that model was probably six years or five years in that location? Yeah, you know, we, we the truth is in districts usually like ours, they kind of try to pick a location, one location for a uh, middle, one for high school. We're gonna have to look at that going forward. This year our principal's pretty adamant they all wanted to try something at, at each of their buildings. So we'll review that and bring that back as we go forward. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, thank you very much for the presentation, Ed. We appreciate it. All right, moving right along, we are at item 3.4. This is an action item, our 2020-2021 audit report. Where is... Hi, it's nice to see you again. Hi there. I'm Jessica Rolfe. I'm with the O&L CPAs, and this is Dave Youngstrom. Um, we're the your audit team for the district. We're going to go through tonight your audit for the June 30th. 2021. Um, it should be a presentation of some sort. Give us one second. We'll work on that for you, Jessica. Brian's going to check on that. I think we got what you need, Jessica. <laughs> Dave likes us so much he can't leave us. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening again. Like I said, we're going to go through the results for your June 30th, 2021 audit. Financial statements are free of any material errors or misstatements. 
and that they're prepared in accordance with the principles that they're supposed to be. One other thing I'll note about the opinion is in the actual statements, we note that we implemented a new standard this year, which the board's probably very aware of. It was GASB 84. That is where we turn those student activity funds into a special revenue fund. So the board would have went ahead and approved a budget for that and looked at that at year end when you did your amendments as well. So that will show up in the statements this year as a new fund. The first slide here, we mostly talk about the general fund, right? That's our main operational fund that we look at the most. This just takes and compares last year to this year for your balance sheet and the general fund. Um, some of the bigger increases, you'll see that due from other governments, that was up some. As we'll talk about a lot through this presentation, as there was a lot of state and federal funding flowing through this year. So that due from other governments line is accounts receivable related to those funds. So with that revenue being up, the receivables were up. Accrued salaries and fringes, that was up a little bit. Again, you know, raises, stipends, step increases, all that factors into that year-end accrual. Other liabilities, those were up as well. Last year, the district was shut down a lot around year-end, so accounts payable were much lower than when the district's in full operation and open, those accounts payables were higher at the end of this year. You'll see there the fund balance was up a little, almost four and a half million, which we'll talk about some more on the next slide, but a good increase to fund balance this year in the general fund. Next slide here are the revenues and expenditures for the whole year for general fund. Revenues up about 9.7 million, and like I said, that federal revenue was a big part of that, almost four and a half million, so those coronavirus relief funds and ESSER one funds were the big ones that ran through there. State funding was up about 3.6 million, and then some local revenue was up a little bit as well, which is mostly property taxes. Expenditures were up a little over 7 million. You know, with new federal funding comes more federal expenses, so that kind of evens out. And then some of the state funding kind of led to more of that change in fund balance increase. So a healthy add to fund balance this year, almost 4.4 million for the general fund, bringing total fund balance to 28.9. Next up, we look at how you did compared to budget. You'll see your final budget, you thought you were gonna have a shortfall of almost a million dollars. We ended up at 4.4, and that was something you guys kinda just hit on. A lot of that was the summer school, and trying to plan for that and decide what we were gonna do. As Mike said, you know, you had kinda planned on eating into some of that general fund money if you needed to. We weren't sure at year end how those ESSER dollars were gonna fall, what year we were gonna be able to record them in, so that was a chunk of it. Just a lot of uncertainty with some of those federal and state funds at the end of the year and where, what period those get recorded in. And I've seen this at most of my districts where we kind of, we didn't know what year end, so we were kind of conservative. And then that number came in a little higher, I'd say, on every district I've talked to so far. So that's normal. It's just kind of a beast this year with things always changing. Next up here, we just compare actual for last year to this year. We kind of talked about that already some, but you can see where that change in fund balance last year was about 1.8. This year, about 4.4. Again, just all that state and federal funding running through. This slide, we look at what percentage your different types of revenue are as a total. Uh, all the percentages were pretty consistent except that federal one. Um, as we've mentioned many times, it was 6% this year, only 1% last year. So those ESSER dollars, coronavirus relief funds really cranked that up as a percentage of your total revenue this year compared to last. This slide shows you kind of the comparison over the last couple years. And you'll see those federal and state numbers, I'm not lying, as we've gone over the years, those have been pretty consistent until this year with all that new funding flowing through. And it's important to note too, a lot of that funding, while everything looks high right now, the revenue looks good, the fund balance went up, the expenditures are up, keep in mind this is one-time funding. Like Brian mentioned, over the next few years, this will trickle in with ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, but then this money goes away. This isn't a permanent thing. So as these numbers get inflated, know that they're likely to come back down after that funding runs through. Similar to the revenues, we look at the expenditures as a percentage of the total. All pretty consistent with last year, except purchase services was up about 
Really mostly the increased custodial and virtual contracted service expense is what cranked that up a little higher than it has been in the past. Everything else pretty consistent. Again, the trend over the last few years where you can see where support, instruction, and other expenses were trending and how those are higher this year as we've spent some of that federal and state money that's come through. This slide, we look at your general fund revenue and expenditure on a per pupil basis. So we take your general fund revenue and expenditures and divide it by your state aid membership. So typically the revenues and expenses should flow together um, as they have been over the years. Again, I point to the fact that those numbers, you know, they go up a lot this year, but that's because of that one-time funding. So that trend in that line will probably be higher over the next two, three years, and then it's gonna come back down and look more similar to 19 and 20 and those previous years as that one-time funding runs out. One of the slides everyone always likes to see is what's that total fund balance as a percentage of expenditures. This year we ended at about 33%. If we only look at your unassigned spendable fund balance, which means most fund, some of your fund balance has been set aside for certain things such as copiers, buses, technology, and also some is restricted that's still sitting out there that came from outside sources. So the fund balance when you take those things out is about 27%. We look at what that equivalent is um, based on number of days. You can either look at it as a calendar year or a school year. So you can see there about 119 days for the calendar year or 59 days for a school year. The unassigned spendable fund balance, if you want to know the actual amount, is down there. It's 23.8 million. Assigned of that fund balance is 3.2. So those are those things that the district has set aside for copiers, technology, buses, all those kind of set aside amounts that the district has decided to put away for those future expenditures that we know are coming. Last up, you've obviously had a lot of bond projects going on the last few years as if COVID and everything else wasn't enough. Let's have all these bond projects too. So balancing all that, you'll see series one was finished. That is complete as of this year. All those funds have been spent. A bond audit was conducted, which said no findings, no issues, felt all the expenditures tested were in compliance. Next one up now is series two. You can see here that one's about 56% complete. So those projects will continue to roll into the next year. Then we had new, one new bond this year, and that's the energy conservation bond. Um, only one year of data here since we just got it about 38% complete as of year end. Then kind of the exciting part of this whole audit, if anything's exciting, is the financial statements and single audit. So what were the actual results of all this? So our financial statement audit, you'll see a lot of no's there, that's a good thing. We had no findings and no comments. We thought everything looked really good. That says a lot for a district that doesn't audit so quickly after year end of your size. Um, it says a whole lot, especially with everything going on this year. So management was very well prepared as always, and that came across in these results. Federal awards, we audit only federal programs as part of all this. Um, we pick certain programs based on a formula. The programs we picked this year were Title I, those new coronavirus relief funds, and then the Education Stabilization Fund, which is your ESSER. Also with those audits, we had no findings, uh, no issues there, an unmodified opinion. We had one management comment this year, and it's really more of a technicality than anything. Your food service fund balance is required to be three months expenditures or less for the most part. Um, it's a little high, as is a lot of people's right now with all the money coming through. When the audit gets submitted, MD automatically does a calculation where they'll look to see if it's over. If it is, they look for a finding. We didn't feel it warranted a finding because you guys have done everything you're supposed to. You know, you're waiting on vendors, you've submitted spend down plans. There's a lot of stuff that you were supposed to get that you haven't gotten. So that fund balance wasn't spent down, but it wasn't because you guys weren't doing what you're supposed to, it's just kind of the times. So we put the comment in there just so when MDE looks, they say, okay, they saw it and this is why they don't feel it's a finding. So it's kind of a technical issue. Um, so that is in there as a comment, but everything was done according to plan and how it should have been. Last up, we always hit any future challenges. I think it's pretty aware 
Um, COVID-19 unfortunately continues to be a really strong issue both for instruction and accounting. Um, spending and compliance related to those state and federal grants, you know, as we saw last year, we didn't always know when those funds were going to be released, what was required, what the compliance requirements were, they were coming out after you already got the money. So those challenges will still exist as those SR2 and SR3 dollars come out, hopefully a little bit less than before. And then we always mention that pension and post-retirement um, liabilities, you know, those fluctuate year to year, it's based on an estimate. Um, it's something that the states decide to put on your books and those continue to sit out there as large liabilities over the years that will get paid down hopefully eventually. And that's really it. Everything went really smooth, like I said. We met with the finance committee about two weeks ago and they reviewed everything in a little more detail as well. So if you have any questions, let us know. Any questions? Jessica, I think you said that the audit was complete on tiers one. Are we approving that tonight too, or do we already need the other? That was up to you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. Yep, that was a little bit ago, probably almost a year ago. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, that is an action item, so we will need to approve the 2020-2021 audit report. Uh, Scott, I moved adoption or approval, or is it acceptance? Is that right? I think we adopt it, right, Mike? Or do acceptance we accept it? Okay. I move acceptance of the 2021 audit report for fair value and then two tiers. Approved or supported? Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, uh, second by Mr. Rausch. Any discussion regarding item 3.4? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. You got it, Brian. You make it easy. Yeah, well done, Brian. Well done. Okay, next up we have another action item. This is item 3.5, the amended fiscal year 2022 tax resolution. Mr. Bruton. Thank you, President Farland. I appreciate it. Um, in your board packet this evening, you have multiple tax resolutions in there. Um, and there's lots of numbers and lots of facts for you. But I really would just like to take about 60 seconds to give you an overarching explanation of, of what happened. Um, this really reaches back to when Proposal A passed back in 1994. And at that time, Midland Public Schools was above what the new established student foundation was. That set a number for us that's been the same set for the past 27 years which is the number of $415.13 per student. That was etched into a tablet at that time. That was the amount that we were allowed to, as a district, to collect from our local taxpayers if they authorized us to, um, in addition to our foundation allowance, above and beyond what the state would give us. So since 1994, Midland Public Schools has been doing a calculation, which we call our hold harmless rate, um, to be able to collect $415.13 per student. Um, typically, the past couple of years, that rate's been somewhere between around 1.6 to 1.8 mils. It fluctuates a little bit based on a formula of what the properties within our jurisdiction are worth and what our predicted student enrollment are. So in June, I bring to you what that proposed hold harmless rate is. That's based on what my prediction of property values are gonna be and also what our student population is gonna be. We have to do that very early um, before the next fiscal year starts. Um, we passed those rates. We adopted it in June for the city of Midland. We further adopted that for the rest of our taxing jurisdictions in July. In the meantime, after that happened, the school aid budget was passed that had the most substantial change to the hold harmless calculation since it was initiated 27 years ago. In boiling everything down and sparing you a 25 minute presentation on all of the idiosyncrasies of the law, our new number is now $122 per student versus the previous $415.13. Um, it's important to note that it does not equate to a loss of funding for Midland Public Schools. It simply means that the state school aid fund is going to make up the $292 difference that our local taxpayers used to make up for us. So it is a reduced burden on the taxable value of our public um, and so once we learned this, we went to all of the experts throughout the state and said, 
what do we do now? Um, because we know that the rate has had to change. It led to a lot of phone calls to the Department of Treasury, to Council, to the Senate Fiscal Agency. Um, they really did help us out in figuring out what to do in an unprecedented situation. So that boils down to a new rate that we are presenting to you this evening, and that new rate changes from the previously adopted 1.7213 hold harmless mills to a new rate of 0 0.6461 mills. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated because these summer tax bills have already gone out in the city of Midland, and those summer tax bills tax at a rate of 0 0.8607 mills, which was a levy that was about 0.2146 mills beyond. We're working with the city of Midland. They're going to help us out once we officially adopt this resolution this evening to figure out how we're going to do the credit on that to make sure that all the taxpayers are held harmless in this and are getting their due in what the reduction in rates are. It's less complicated in our taxing jurisdictions outside the city of Midland because we only assess the hold harmless rate on the winter taxes one time. So we've got this in time to be able to reduce that rate from the previous one down to the new 0.6461 um, and also will give us time to again um, make it right within the city of Midland and we do appreciate what Dave Keenan and his team is going to do for us on that end as well too. So that's the very high level overview of what happened. It is a benefit to the local taxpayers um, here in the city of Midland and our other taxing jurisdictions and we do need you to take action this evening to change those rates to what we now believe are the appropriate rates to align with the changes in the state aid legislation. Thank you, Brian. Too deep into the weeds for you? I'm sorry? Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, a decrease in taxes. That's great news. Okay, this is an action item, so I will accept the motion. We'll make a motion to amend the fiscal year 2022 tax resolution as stated in item 3.5 before the floor vote. Motion by Mr. Rausch, support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any further discussion regarding item 3.5? They said that even if that this um, happens tonight, then we'll talk a little bit more seriously. Okay. We've been talking on the phone back and forth. They're not quite sure how they're going to do it, but they are working on it behind the scenes, and I'll keep you updated in FFO um, once we know more and how they're going to do that for us. Treasury's been involved, and Truen's been involved, and we've had a lot of experts because we're one of the few districts with a low hold harmless where this has occurred. Okay. Any other comments, discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right. Next up, we have a presentation on COVID-19. We have a um, very highly qualified, I think, esteemed panel of, of local experts uh, who are going to address us tonight um, about all things COVID locally. Uh, they have, a, a, I'm sure, a number of topics to talk about, and they will at the end field some questions if there are any from the board and I will just leave it at that. I'm going to start with introductions from my right to left. We have Dr. Courtney Pearson, if you would just want to raise your hand, infectious disease with MidMichigan Health. Um, to her right is Dr. Paul Berg, family medicine and president of the MidMichigan Physician Group. Um, moving on, we have Dr. Adam Hamilton, pediatrics, MidMichigan Health. and. We have Dr. Michael, is it Elfman? He's silent. Okay. Um, professor of Immunology and Infectious Disease, Central Michigan University. Welcome all of you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And Mr. Berg, the floor is yours. Dr. Berg, I apologize. That's okay. Uh, thank you. We appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and speak with you. Um, we'll keep our remarks relatively brief, and then we're uh, happy to answer any questions from the board. So I'm going to start by just giving a, a little lay of the Pearson will speak briefly about uh, some of our mitigation strategies, especially around masking. Uh, Dr. Elfman will speak briefly about some vaccine uh, updates. And, and then finally, Dr. Hamilton will give some updates uh, about the recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics. So um, one piece of data that we follow is our own internal MidMichigan Health data. You know, we operate seven hospitals and 90 clinics over 23 counties. 
currently in the pandemic, we have admitted nineteen hundred and thirty six patients, so almost two thousand patients have been admitted. we've had two hundred and eighty five deaths in the health system and we have had seven hospitalizations in patients less than age twenty although admittedly we do not admit a lot of pediatric patients to our hospitals. they typically go to covenant or u of m, the higher tertiary ah care centers or peds. in terms of ah midland county data there have been almost seventy two hundred cases in midland county, two hundred and forty four hospitalizations and to date one hundred confirmed deaths new daily cases is one way that we follow the pandemic and really we we think in terms of waves. the pandemic has really hit us in three defined waves. the first wave was last fall and this was the biggest one we were seeing upwards of thirty to forty new cases per day in the county and one day we peaked at one hundred and twelve new cases things died down during the winter time but in the spring the second wave hit we again were running daily case rates of about thirty to forty new patients per day in midland county and then things improved in the summertime. may and june it really seemed to quiet off we were seeing as few as five new cases per day but in august and september in the last eight weeks we've again hit what we are now in the third wave so we are again seeing thirty to forty new cases per day the other way that we look at this is with a test positivity rate so of all the tests that we order in any given day or any given week what percent of those tests come back positive in the summertime we were at a good place we were down around one to two percent now we're currently running ten percent so in the last seven days we've ordered three thousand tests and of those three thousand approximately three hundred have returned positive in terms of the state data it seems to mirror what we see here in midland county they've had three defined waves across the state it's worth noting that the state fatality rate is two point one percent so two point one percent of patients that get covid are unfortunately dying from covid um, the state of Michigan also publishes uh, school outbreaks. So I did uh, look at that information as recent as five o'clock uh, this afternoon. Uh, as of today, Midland County has two new school related outbreaks at Meridian High and Meridian uh, Junior High and ongoing outbreaks at Northwood University, Adams Elementary, Chestnut Hill, Woodcrest, Central Park Elementary, and Jefferson Middle School. Some interesting national data specifically around kids is the following. Um, with the Delta variant, as you know, now comprises about 99% of the variants that we see across the U.S. We are seeing evidence that the Delta variant is as transmissible in kids as it is in adults. Their viral load in their nasal pharyngeal specimens is, uh, is as high as adults. So unfortunately, some of the data early in the pandemic which suggested that uh, COVID was not as transmissible in kids, that seems to have shifted. Incubation period is about the same in kids. It averages about three to five days. Um, it's estimated, however, that up to half of infections in kids are asymptomatic. So up to 50% of kids who get COVID won't have any symptoms, and yet they may have a high viral load and are still able to transmit that virus to other kids. And while hospitalization rates in kids remain low, unfortunately it is increasing. And again, that's a result of the Delta variant. Children, when they get to, uh, seriously ill with COVID, they have similar symptoms to adults. They have respiratory failure, myocarditis, and shock. Uh, children can also get a syndrome called MICS, or multi-inflammatory, um, uh, multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome. This is a syndrome where a kid gets COVID and within several days they spike very high fevers and then they have multiple organ uh, system failure. Nationally, we've seen 4,661 cases of MISD and 41 deaths from MISD. Total nationally in the pediatric population, we've had 55,000 hospitalizations. And half of those hospitalizations in kids are in otherwise healthy kids with no comorbidities. And unfortunately, we've had 516 deaths total in the pediatric population since the beginning of the pandemic. So my take home points is that unfortunately, as much as we all want the pandemic to be over, it's not. We're still in a third wave. COVID-19 is not a benign condition in kids. <clears throat> in total, COVID-19 is the third leading cause of death in the US currently. And in some months, COVID-19 has reached the top 10 causes of death in children. So we do need to continue to be vi uh, vigilant in how we respond to the pandemic. Um, Dr. Pearson, I think you're gonna talk next about some masking updates. Yes, I appreciate, can you hear me okay? Yes. I appreciate the chance to speak at the meeting. So over the last year, we've had the opportunity to see several real world school examples that have shown lower transmission rates when layered protection is implemented. So when we discuss layer protection, it means using all the available tools that we have. So this is universal masking, social distancing, frequent hand washing, increasing ventilation, 
vaccination of all eligible persons, easy access to testing, contact tracing, and staying home when feeling ill. As we discuss this risk mitigation strategy, we must remember this school year is going to have new challenges with the Delta variant as the predominant circulating strain. The Delta variant has been shown to be twice as contagious as prior variants with viral loads a thousand times higher. When we discuss communicable disease and risk of transmission, we often use a term called R0. This describes the number of people that one person, when infected, in this case with COVID, will go on to infect. The R0 of the initial strain was around two to three, but with Delta, that number has increased to around six to eight. This means that one person infected with the Delta variant can go on to infect between six to eight susceptible people. So first, I would like to emphasize the importance of masking. Universal masking in schools, regardless of vaccination status, is currently recommended by the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and numerous uh, major academic pediatric centers. Masking is a safe, effective, and inexpensive risk reduction strategy. This is based on multiple real-world epidemiologic, observational, and modeling studies that have shown decreased transmission with mask wearing. While masks worn in the community setting certainly add a layer of protection to the wearer, the major benefit of masking in this setting is actually as a form of source control. Masks block respiratory droplets of potentially infectious persons. COVID is contagious prior to symptom onset, so it is important that everyone participates in mask wearing. Efficacy in decreasing transmission and outbreaks is improved when there are high rates of mask use. This is why we need a universal approach to masking rather than an individualistic approach. In addition, thanks to the amazing work from the scientific community, we now have safe and effective vaccines for everyone age 12 and above. On May 10th of this year, the FDA expanded emergency use authorization to ages 12 to 15. And since that time, millions of adolescents have been vaccinated. So we now have extensive real world knowledge of safety. We know areas with lower community COVID case accounts have lower risk of cases when returning to in-person learning. COVID vaccination promotion is a key strategy to lower community prevalence of this disease. We are still waiting on authorization for children and for vaccines in children under 12, which Pfizer did have a big announcement today um, about submitting data that looks very hopeful. So the best way to protect our children is for everyone who's eligible to receive the vaccine to do so. As previously mentioned, of course, other strategies, including the social distancing with cohorting, hand washing, contact tracing, and proper ventilation remain an important strategy. Studies have found that simple measures, including opening windows and increasing ventilation can lead to significant risk reduction. Finally, we have to remember that kids do not live or go to school in a vacuum. Children transmit COVID as effectively as adults, many of whom may be at increased risk of severe disease. We have seen numerous examples of schools opening without these measures and failing to keep their students and teachers safe. This is an incredibly difficult time, but I urge everyone to embrace all our available tools to allow children to continue in-person learning and keep our teachers and communities safe. Thank you. Dr. Elfman. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pearson, for that, uh, uh, that explanation of, uh, of a layered approach. Um, I appreciate the chance to speak tonight. Um, I'm here as a proud parent of two students that are attending Midland Public Schools. I also happen to be uh, Assistant Professor of Immunology and Infectious Disease at Central Michigan University's College of Medicine. I want to mention that all the opinions and views that I'm giving here are as an individual and don't reflect that of my institution. Um, I went to college at MSU with a degree in microbiology, went on to get my PhD in immunology and infectious disease from Penn State University. And I've done research uh, at Penn State and U of M and immune responses to viral infection. My intention here tonight is just to simply provide some information about the effectiveness and safety of the COVID-19 vaccine. One of these, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine is fully approved for adolescents and adults age 16 and up and can be given to adolescents from age 12 to 15 under an emergency use, au use authorization by the Food and Drug Administration. Two other vaccines, the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccine can also be given to adults 
under the EUA. Now, no vaccine ever is 100% perfect, but recently published data suggests that all three vaccines are between 71 to 93% effective at preventing hospitalization in adults uh, in the real world. Over 380 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been given safely. There are very rare complications that can occur, but these range in less than seven per million uh, per vaccine recipient. Now, there's two technologies that are being used in these vaccines that I just want to take a moment to, uh, to provide information about. Uh, these include the mRNA technology and viral vaccine vectors. mRNA vaccines uh, use uh, messenger RNA molecules, which basically provides instructions for cells to make the spike protein from the virus that causes COVID-19. Once your cells uh, get this RNA inside them, they make the protein, they use that protein, and your immune system will, learn, will then learn how to make antibodies against the virus. Those antibodies are what block the virus from infecting our cells uh, by preventing it from attaching to our cells. Uh, the RNA molecule itself never goes anywhere near your DNA and becomes degraded by your cells. mRNA-based vaccines have been studied in animals since the early 90s and have been used in humans for over a decade in experiments. A viral vector is a virus that is used to carry instructions to our cells. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine uses a harmless virus to deliver DNA instructions to make cells to make the viral spike protein. But the vector can't copy itself, and DNA from the vector does not integrate into our own DNA. The particular adenovirus used in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been used experimentally in humans since 2014. Uh, I want to conclude with uh, the, the statement that these vaccines are both safe and effective at reducing severe disease from COVID-19. My wife, my oldest son, and myself have all been vaccinated. And I encourage everyone to be vaccinated against COVID-19. I support the uh, County Health Department and uh, all of Midland Public Schools' efforts to promote vaccination. And I thank you for your time this evening. Dr. Hamilton. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Berg, and to the school board for the opportunity to speak tonight. I come to before you as a pediatrician with over 10 years of experience caring for children in our community. And as a representative of other community pediatricians and family medicine doctors that provide health care for the thousands of children in Midland County. We have spent our adult lives working to become experts in the health and well-being of young people. And we would like nothing more than to get to the other side of this pandemic, knowing we have done everything we can to keep these children and their families physically and emotionally well. We work hard to practice evidence-based medicine and our recommendations are based in fact and science. In accordance with the American Academy of Pediatrics, we strongly advocate that all district policy considerations should start with the goal of keeping students safe and physically present in school. We know that remote learning over the past year and a half was detrimental to the educational attainment of students of all ages and exacerbated mental health issues among children and adolescents. When in-person school services were not available during the pandemic, disparities worsened, especially for children who are English language learners, children with disabilities, children living in poverty, and those who identify as minorities. As we start this school year, a substantial portion of students, including all elementary students, are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. In addition, the COVID Delta variant is much more contagious than the other strains we experienced in the previous two school years. Due to this, and because we strive to have all students physically present in school, we advocate for a multi-layered approach similar to what Dr. Pearson mentioned earlier. That includes physical distancing, hand washing, proper ventilation, isolation, quarantining, and testing when one is sick or exposed to somebody with COVID and completing COVID vaccination for all who are eligible to receive it in order to maximize the possibility of in-person learning. The other main strategy to reduce risk of infection that we are here to discuss tonight is for all students, teachers, and staff to correctly wear well-fitted masks while indoors in school. 
Failure to institute a universal masking policy in school will result in unnecessary harm to children and adults in community. It will significantly increase the number of children um, and out of school, both due to COVID infections and because of requirement to quarantine when they are exposed to COVID as well. This will subsequently increase the likelihood of returning to virtual learning, which has already been shown to be detrimental to educational progress. All the most respected health organizations in the United States recommend universal masking in schools, regardless of vaccination status. Policymakers and scientists with the greatest expertise in the health of children and communities have analyzed all available data and generate clear guidance. Per the American Academy of Pediatrics, all students older than two years of age and all school staff should wear face masks at school unless medical or developmental conditions prohibit use. The CDC echoes this idea with the following statement. Due to the circulating and highly contagious Delta variant, the CDC recommends universal indoor masking by all students aged two and older and visitors to K through 12 schools regardless of vaccination status. In addition, the Infectious Disease Society of America, the American Academy of Family Physicians and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services have also endorsed these guidelines. We can all agree that keeping our kids physically present in schools is a top priority. To accomplish this, we need to use every tool at our disposal to minimize the transmission of COVID-19 in our community. Vaccination and masking are two of these primary keys. Until children under 12 are eligible for the vaccine, we are very, they are vulnerable to illness themselves and will continue to contribute to spread in the community to those who they come in contact with. Keeping them masked will help uh, maximize the chance they can remain physically present in school and will minimize the risk of continued spread of COVID-19 in the community. To the school board, I empathize with the difficult position you guys are in. You're having to make medical decisions when this is not necessarily your background. I appreciate that you've implemented mask requirements for those that are under 12 and who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. I would urge you to continue this requirement, but also to extend the mask requirement to all students and staff, regardless of age and vaccination status, so that we can have the greatest protection for all who are inside your school and in our community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. At this time, I'll open it up to the board for any questions or comments. So. I, I guess I, I, I have one. Um, and I know, I, I think it's directed to Dr. Pearson, but please, any, anybody, any of our panelists, please feel free to respond. Um, as Dr. Hamilton alluded to, I'm a history major. I have absolutely no experience in anything in anthropology. I, so we have had foisted upon us, in, uh, or the superintendent has, in consultation with the board, the uh, need to make decisions that are entirely outside of our expertise. And we've been bombarded with dozens, if not over 100 emails, many of which have links to news articles that say masks don't work. I've read them all. I've read all. I've clicked the links on 47 news articles, references to CDC study. I don't have the expertise to make sense of them um, because they say things that sound like they're, they're logical. Things like, well, the droplet size is too small and it'll get through the cloth mask or whatever. There's lots of stuff out there. Well, can somebody please distill it? So that a five-year-old can understand it, do masks work? Yeah. So misinformation has been a significant burden on this pandemic, and is certainly prolonging the pandemic and costing lives. And it's unfortunate that these articles come to light. Misinformation from the NIH. Please. You're going to get a chance to speak. Let them speak first, please. Just be respectful. Look, folks, just please be respectful. Okay. You'll all have a chance. I am only here to help a 
health guidance as infectious disease is my expertise and I care about the well-being of our children and community. That's the only reason that I'm here. And so, yes, misinformation is costing lives and it's been in this pandemic and I will say that again. Learning how to understand scientific articles is very difficult. It takes years and years of experience, medical school, residency, fellowships to understand how to critically evaluate a scientific article. So I absolutely understand that these clickbait articles are very difficult to interpret and you can make them sound um, very important. So it's, it's hard to reevaluate that. And so, yes, masks absolutely work. Is there the randomized control trials that we come to expect in medicine as the highest level standard of trials? Well, unfortunately, in a public health emergency where millions of people are dying, one in 500 Americans have died from COVID, those aren't the kind of studies that are going to be done. So numerous studies have shown that masking is effective while, as long as it's using a well-fitted um, mask. Yeah, I think I'd probably uh, echo that too. I, I'm uh, sometimes equally confused when I get online and I try to find the articles and do mass work, do they not? I think to Courtney's point, some of the challenges, we, we don't have a perfect scientific trial. You know, wouldn't it be great if you could take 100,000 people prospectively, mask all of them, the other half not mask them, follow them over a reasonable amount of time, really get the power you need for a high quality uh, study like that. The reality is we can't do that in the midst of a pandemic. So what they look at is basic science evidence. Look at what your different masks do in a lab with droplet particle size. They look at epidemiological data. So retrospective analyses with schools or counties or countries where they have implemented mask mandates with a comparative uh, geography that perhaps hasn't. What has viral transmission done? The preponderance of that evidence strongly favors that yes, masks do have a positive impact. What is that impact? It's hard to say, because some of these studies, they haven't masked everybody. Maybe they only masked half the people. Maybe it wasn't universal masking. Maybe it wasn't high quality masks. So when you see that evidence, you'll see ranges. Masks are probably somewhere between 30 to 80% effective, depending on the mask, depending on whether you mask everybody or just a few. But at the end of the day, masks are not perfect. Masks will not prevent all viral spread, but they do help. So it's one strategy out of many, just like social distancing and hand hygiene and quarantining. So if you have a low cost tool that has some impact at disease mitigation, it should be part of the toolbox. Thank you, very helpful. Maybe for timing on five to 11 year olds, if anybody could talk more specifically about that. I know there was some decent news out today. And yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to handle that. Um, there was some, uh, there's been already encouraging studies on the 5.11 year age range. In fact, a news article was just released today from Pfizer. And they anticipate more likely getting their data to the FDA for emergency review um, within the next um, several years, if not sooner. Um, what I'm hearing is that um, they will hopefully be able to Okay, thank you. Uh, I, Dr. Berg, I have a, a question. Brad, oh, Brad, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, Dr. Elson, you opened with qualifications to say that you are here speaking your thoughts, your opinions, your training, and your expertise. Sure. Um, Dr. Berg, Dr. Hamilton, and Dr. Pearson, Dr. Pearson did say that she's here because of personal reasons. Um, are you here 
other so, than that. Yeah, so as an executive at MidMichigan Health, I would say I'm not here officially on behalf of MidMichigan Health. I wouldn't go so far to say that, but our views are very much in line with the health system. Okay, Dr. Berg, I'm sorry, I was going to ask you, you, you had mentioned that we are in our third wave of this pandemic. Um, any idea on how long this wave may last and will the waves continue to come as perhaps new variants uh, develop? Is there any information about any new variants? Um, just to kind of add on to that no, discussion. No, good question. Those are questions we debate um, all the time at the health system. So uh, if this, the prior wave, the first two waves lasted several months, about two to three months for each wave. So if this current wave holds true, we really should be through this wave October, November timeframe. Uh, several things have changed since then though. The Delta variant is behaving differently than the prior variants. It's much more contagious uh, and people are getting much sicker with the Delta variant. But also we have over 60% of the population vaccinated. So that's the other thing that has shifted. So in many ways, we're not seeing quite as many total daily cases because we have more than half the population vaccinated. Um, so it, great question. Um, if one thing this pandemic has taught us, it's almost impossible to predict how this is gonna behave. To the question about variants, uh, we were one, there's literally dozens of variants that the uh, health departments are monitoring. The, the Mu variant was one that you may have seen on the news. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, uh, the only variant, 99% of the strains that we're seeing are the Delta variant. So it's difficult to predict what's going to go beyond that. The other fortunate news, and, and I think you know, Mike could probably uh, uh, attest to this as well, the vaccines uh, thus far seem effective against all the variant strains. We've not seen any variant strain that is vaccine resistant, and that's very good news so far. I don't know if you want to add to that, Mike. Well, we, have, we haven't seen anything resistant yet uh, that's on a large scale, but we hope it doesn't come to that. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, all of you. We appreciate your time tonight. Guys, let's go. Hey. Go ahead. Thank you very much. No. 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 Do you want to address that? Would you please? Yes, there will be. Look, here's the deal. These doctors took the time to come tonight to answer questions. He's doing the best, he's doing the best he can to answer your questions. You owe him the respect to listen to what he has to say. Or if I were him, I'd go home and spend some time with my family. Okay? Let him finish. Let him finish or Officer Henson is going to okay. show you right there.
I haven't said anything in the last two minutes because I was letting people speak. You can hear me now? How about now? Brian, you want to give me yours? Try. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So first of all, um, the question you just repeat that one more time for me, please. What mass? Well, what affects emotionally, socially, physiologically? Those those masks really have on our kids. What studies have been done to show that? So, like a lot of information that's out there right now, it's evolving. There has not been any randomized controlled studies to address that, so I have to put that out there first, okay? That being said, there are exceptions to mask use um, for the American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, and I shared those earlier. Um, that's gonna be based off of age, um, under two. The main reason is due to the choking concerns. Um, the other thing is going to be developmental issues, and yes, there are some issues that some students in the school may have valid reasons not to use them. Um, that could be issues with speech impediments, that could be issues with developmental concerns such as autism spectrum. Um, so there are certain things that are legitimate reasons that us as pediatricians, family practice researchers, would um, apply for a mask um, exception in those cases. That being said, there's been lots of information in regards to oxygenation, development, things along those lines. And I'm very confident, although I can't say anything widespread so I just stay there, but I'm very confident that there is no issues with um, long-term issues with um, development um, or understanding of the child without any issues that would impact it. So I'm sorry I can't give you a little more specific thing. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. All right, that will bring us to item four, request to address the board. And as you can see, we've got a lot of people that want to come up and talk tonight, uh, 25 for that, that matter. Um, so guys, listen, on behalf of the board and the administration, we appreciate you all and, and thank you for being here tonight to share your thoughts and opinions. Uh, the rules are gonna be the same as any other meeting. Uh, the board is not going to be here to engage, is not here to engage in active dialogue. Um, we're here to listen to your comments. If there is a question that needs to be answered, we'll get it to you in writing as soon as we can. Uh, when addressing the board, again, like I said, there's 25 people that want to speak tonight that are on the list up here. Uh, so we have three minutes to speak, and that's, that's why we have to be brief tonight, so we can get everybody in and still get out of here at a reasonable time without having to adjourn the meeting and reconvene it. Um, before we begin, I just want to remind you of a couple things. Uh, tonight, you all are going to share your thoughts with everyone in this room and the community at large about, quite frankly, hot topics that have been tearing our district apart. Uh, there's going to be opposing thoughts and opinions. None are more important than the other. Please remember, everybody, that we're all human in here. We're friends and neighbors, family. We work together, play together, and collectively make up this great community. Everybody in here, including those on this stage, want nothing more than the very best for our students. Safety and well-being of all students is the number one priority of this administra administration, and every effort is being made to maintain an in-person learning environment for our kids. Knowing this, I ask all of you to show compassion tonight, understanding and respect for all those wishing to address the board. Let's conduct ourselves with civility. Tonight, guys, we have a chance to shine and to be a model for our children, our community, and others watching our district. I hope and trust that we can seize that opportunity. And with that being said, Everett, is it collect? Yes, I'm sorry, sir. 
Welcome, thank you for joining us tonight. You have the floor. Thank you, board members, for the time. As a physician and former teacher, I'll be speaking regarding vaccinations and masks and other interventions that our specialists have talked about that pertain to decisions that you as board members are unfortunately burdened with. I speak on behalf of myself and my family. From 2001 to 2013, I worked in various public schools and at the university level teaching preschool through college level classes. In 2013, I left my public education career and started my training as a physician. I completed my degree in medicine in 2017, followed by practice in Jackson, Michigan, and then at the Mayo Clinic, before relocating to Midland with my family. I have experienced the very heart of this pandemic. At the Mayo Clinic, of those of my patients that survived, some of my patients exceeded six months of hospitalization and in recovery from COVID-19 and remained permanently disabled. To maintain our shared goal of the highest level of educational experience for our children, the evidence was clear get vaccinated, wear masks whenever possible, and socially distance ourselves when possible. And other measures, as my colleagues have mentioned. Other organizations from the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, the American Association of Pediatricians, the American Osteopathic Association, the American Medical Association, have all advocated for vaccines, wearing masks, and social distancing when possible. There is essentially universal agreement on this. The first step in ensuring that our children and those they have contact with are safe are vaccines. These vaccines are built on decades of research and have been shown to be safe and remarkably effective. With hundreds of millions of doses given and only a handful of serious adverse events, their safety is not in question. Increasing our vaccination rate is our best weapon against this pandemic. When you get the vaccine, you protect yourself. However, critically, you greatly reduce the risk that you become a vector to transmit this virus. In other words, your vaccine protects those around you. It is so critical that all of us understand this. If unvaccinated, you are a potential vector for this virus. There are some people that cannot be vaccinated or for whom vaccinations are less effective. These include currently children under age 11 and those with various medical conditions. It is these populations that are most at risk, but we all can protect them with a wall of immunity when those around them are vaccinated and with masks and social distancing. The only way to strengthen their protection is for the people around them to make decisions to protect their safety. Masks work, and if everyone is wearing them, they work better. And with so few vaccinated, they are a critical line of defense from this virus. School board members, if mandating masks for every student and staff would save one life in our community, would it not be worth it? Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Laura Cunningham. Welcome, Laura. The floor is yours. Thank you. My name is Laura Cunningham, and I am a Midland resident, and I am a mother. I have two children in the Midland public school system. I have a fifth grader and a first grader. Tonight, my focus will be on my first grader, Gavin, and other children like him who struggle with wearing a mask. Kids with sensory processing sensitivity have a much harder time than other kids who are less sensitive. I'm referring to their nervous system when I'm referring to their sensitivity, and I'm gonna quickly read a description of what a highly sensitive child is. A highly sensitive child has a very sensitive nervous system. That means they process information from the senses more deeply and more thoroughly than a non-highly sensitive child. They notice many tiny details and they think about these all the time. They can't turn off this constant awareness of their world. They, they experience and feel very intensely. They have an inner intensity dial that's turned up several notches beyond the setting for a non-highly sensitive child. This causes overload. All of this awareness and intensity is exhausting for them. And this causes them to be overstimulated. And this is without a mask. 
this is just normal, them going through their day, their school day, trying to absorb all this information in their environment without a mask. My experience with my son, who is highly sensitive, struggled with the mask because it causes him to focus on his breathing and he says that he can't breathe very well. So then he has, he has forced to think about that. And if he takes off his mask, he is scared that he's going to get in trouble. So he, so he can't because he doesn't want to get in trouble. He doesn't want to go to the principal's office. So these children are terrified. And on top of that, they, they have their, their, their senses are overloaded. So, on, so they have a mask on their face they're constantly fidgeting with it. The, the, mask, the masks that are coming home are, are disgusting, dirty. And it's, it's just really sad as a parent to be going through this because from everything that I've read personally um, and from doctors that I personally have, have researched, they're low risk. His, the elementary ch children are not, at, are not a high risk group COVID. The people that are high risk have a vaccine available to them. So that is why I feel that it should be the parent's choice whether we send our children to school in a mask or not. I'm not against masks. I just want to be able to choose what is best for my child. And thank you. That's it. Thank you, Laura. Chad Anders. Good evening, Mr. Anders. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, gentlemen. The mask issue isn't about freedom. It's about personal responsibility and being accountable for yourself and your actions. I'm not only speaking for mask supporting, but more specifically for exhausted adults. We are all tired of this. The most tired being those who've done all they can only to have it ruined by the choices of others, and that isn't right. I'm not turning my voice to disagree, discredit, or discount any of the attending opinions shared in this room. Every plea spoken to life at this meeting is a parent's voice who only wants what's right for their child. My goal is to simply cut through the minutia that makes this feel like the complicated discussion that it isn't. We literally have a school year pandemic under our belts already. With all of you at the helm, that's significant because last year MDS attained high marks for COVID prevention. Honestly, we're not achieving that this year. Right now, if you saw, if you saw what worked then and had our support, what's changed? We've heard from some professionals tonight. I am not. As a non-expert, I'd like to speak on it in terms I can relate to. Exactly 100% of us can look at a decent radar and tell you if we agree with the weatherman on whether it's going to rain or not. Who among us, however, can look at the same cluster and with the same certainty tell you if it's going to hail or if it's going to be a tornado? Almost none of us. We dabbled enough to help us in our day to day, but when the siren sounds, we all know we're headed to the basement. That, my friends, is an interesting distinction. With weather, we're all heroes when it comes to mining a pleasant day for all it's worth, but for the most part, we know when it's time to hang it up. Well, we're at that time, you guys. The tornado alarms have been going off. There's near absolute scientific agreement worldwide of the most effective measures to mitigate this pandemic. Take off your cage and see it for what it is. Being informed enough to read what experts have written means you have, an, you have their expert peer-reviewed conclusion, not an authority to reinterpret it. Just doing so is betting against the house on good intentions of leaving rich. Well, these are children and futures and families, not chips on a table. It's not our kids versus your kids, and it's not every kid for themselves. This should be everyone for everyone, just as it was after 9-11. We do our parts in that by being accountable for ourselves. Prevention of germ spread, whether from distancing, masking, vaccine, or sanitizing, are things that are able to keep unnecessary burdens from being passed to friends, neighbors, and businesses. Each person is capable of determining what risk they are comfortable with, but their actions should reflect keeping the consequences of those choices their own. Some feel they are being robbed of their independence by requiring to wear a mask, and others feel they are being robbed by not wearing one. The implications of their free choice should not become my responsibility. You'd never be able to make the case that my family should wear gas masks so that you can smoke wherever you please, because risks associated with smoking were your choice to undertake and not mine. This is no different. The fastest path to returning to a feeling of normal, for everything to stay open and in-person learning to stay available, is to stop pretending like the free choices of some aren't having unintended, con unintended consequences on everyone else. As members of this board, you are not just public officials and elected representatives, you are the shepherds guiding our children to adulthood. You steer their futures. Your leadership keeps them safe while they're away from us. You are their guardians. 
Certainly more can be done to keep them safe from COVID at school besides being another victim of exhaustion and leaving things to chance. Thank you. Thank you. Rob Johnston. Good evening, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate your time. Thank you. The floor is yours. Get set up here for a second. Okay. All right. So I believe everyone in this room wants what's best for the children. Uh, that being said, some of the decisions that have come down around masking, uh, they don't sit well with me, mainly because I know a little bit about filtration. Um, let's just read what the masks say. This mask does not remove the risk of contamination or disease or infection. This one is PM 2.5, and I thought that would be good because it has an official rating, right? But I looked it up. Unfortunately, it means that it's capable of filtering 2.5 microns. That would be cool if COVID wasn't 0.125 microns. Let's see what this one says. Uh, this product eh, is not intended for medical protection. Even the prestigious N95 isn't exactly rated for the size of COVID. Uh, it's, for your point of reference, I guess it's 95% effective at 0.3 microns. So 95% effective at double the size of what COVID is. Um, this should be the parent's choice. Just real quick, these doctors sp spoke on the vaccine. I downloaded all the VAERS data since 1990. There have been 1.5 million adverse effects in all of VAERS history. 700,000 of them are from last year, from this year. How can we say that it's safe and effective when we've doubled our number of people having adverse effects in a single year? And also things that have changed in, a certain, in one single year is teen suicide. It's gone up 30%. I mean, what are we doing to these kids? This should be our choice. We should be unmasking our children. You guys should not be deciding that. And I feel really bad that you're in that position, actually. I, I don't want to be in your position. But if I was, I would have to leave it to these people. They know their kids. They know what ailments they have. They know, they know their kids, right? So over the summer, <laughs> I went a little off script there. <laughs> So over the summer, we had hoped that a plan was being developed because we knew COVID wasn't going away. But instead of making the schools a safer place, several schools got new parking lots and other renovations. Um, that bothered me because I know there's technology out there that could make this go away. And I happen to know you have a talented engineer on your board. I would challenge you guys to develop a system for us that would work to actually kill COVID, that would actually work to make our children safer. It would look like an HVA system that has higher turnovers can actually filter 0.125 microns, has in-duct air sanitization systems like the Remy Halo, which has been proven to kill COVID at 99.99%. Not this. If you were to be honest and tell me what a system looked like that was designed to kill COVID in schools, it would surely not look like a cloth mask. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Johnson. Mindy Cox. Good evening, Mindy. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I'm a mother of three girls with an MPS. I would like to address the board tonight with questions specifically about the COVID testing protocol. Um, I've attempted to contact the superintendent and the board with emails visiting the administration building. I've also attempted to make contact with the Midland County Health Department with my questions. All have, all have gone unanswered. Um, so let me address you tonight with my concerns and why as parents we may have issue with them and with the lack of transparency. Are you all familiar that a majority of PCR COVID tests have been recalled by the FDA and the CDC and their emergency use authorization will end in December of this year? 
Over 300 manufacturer's tests have been recalled due to an inordinate frequency of false positives and negative results. From the FDA's website, the following is stated regarding this recall. The FDA has identified this as a class one recall, the most serious type of recall, use of these devices may cause serious injuries or death. So my question is this, what specific tests are being used on our children? Have the tests being used been recalled? And if so, why is this the method of testing being implemented as stated the testing provided frequencies of false positives and negative results, making them inaccurate and unreliable? So the policies potentially in place by our school district may inflate these numbers that we are seeing and perpetuate this cycle of inaccurate results. Let's quit testing healthy kids that are asymptomatic altogether and in turn leave it up to parents to get medical treatment for their kids when needed. Even more concerning, my next question is this. Many of these swabs being used for testing have been coated in ethylene oxide. Many manufacturers have used ethylene oxide on their swabs. Did you know the EO is listed under OSHA and the CDC as a proven highly toxic carcinogen? Further studies of ethylene oxide have proven that it is most harmful when inhaled. Look up ethylene oxide on the CDC's website and you will see the following. Acute toxic effects of ethylene oxide in humans include acute skin, respiratory, eye irritation, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, Chronic effects in humans include anemia, respiratory irritation with susceptibility to secondary respiratory infection. So our current policies of testing kids multiple times a day with potentially recalled tests and swabs are concerning to me and I would like answers. These tests may very well be causing more COVID-like symptoms in our population and in turn causing our kids to miss crucial days of instruction. There are alternative methods of testing that are not harmful. Why can't MPS use the saliva method of testing? Did you parents even know that was an option, that your child can spit a tiny amount of saliva in a tiny tube, and it would not be harmful or exposing our children to any harmful chemicals? Um, I would just like to have the option for more testing and more transparency as parents across with the board with the decisions, what exactly is being used. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Todd Kruger. Good evening, Mr. Kruger. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thanks for having me speak to you. Floor is yours. All right. My wife and I um, are all lucky to live in, we're all lucky to live in Midland. My wife and I know from experience that Midland has a uh, great public school with outstanding teachers and leadership. We also know from experience it has outstanding physicians. <laughs> As a layman, one second. As a layman, I would like to speak regarding the Midland Public School mask policy, which was adopted October 19th, 2020. This mask policy was written in a manner that allows the mask mandate to be activated by one person in lieu of a vote from the board. Quote, the superintendent may activate this policy by notifying the school community requiring all school staff, volunteers, and visitors to wear appropriate face mask coverings, end quote. I wonder, by allowing unilateral effectuation of the mask policy and thus precluding the, the, um, any board vote thereof, does our mask policy violate the spirit, if not the letter, of the Open Meetings Act? According to the Michigan Municipal League, the basic intent of the Michigan Open Meetings Act is to require public bodies to conduct business at open meetings. Clearly, activation of the mask mandate policy is important business. We all agree, just like how many people are here. Why then isn't the mandate deliberated and voted upon by our elected officials in an open meeting such as this, pursuant to the Open Meetings Act? It needs to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kruger.
All right, folks, I'm going to need some help with this one. I'm looking at the list here, and there is a Will Zablocki from Plymouth, and there is a William Zablocki. Is that the same person further down in the list? Ah. Okay, so you are Will, correct? Okay. Will, you're up. Come on up. William, we'll get to you later down the list if, in fact, you wanted to speak, sir. Welcome, Mr. Zablocki. Thank you for joining us tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, I came here to speak on um, one specific topic, and it, again, it, it goes to the accountability. Um, I'm a parent of four children. I have four children in Plymouth, um, two in kindergarten, one in second grade, and one in fourth grade. Um, I'm a graduate of Midland High School. I've lived here since 1992, very familiar with the schools. And after the, the policy for masking was implemented um, in private or outside of a public setting, um, we started looking into some of these details here and expressing our concerns to the board. And it, it's our viewpoint, and we allege that the superintendent has failed to uphold his responsibilities as, desp as defined in the MPS policy manual. Um, as an organized group of concerned parents, the, the superintendent has repeatedly failed to work with us regarding our concerns relating to the mask mandate. The policy manual school, school code 1230, item K, defines the responsibility of the superintendent to work cooperatively with parents and community groups concerned with programs in our schools. We have been denied a voice for our children, and contrary to MPS's purported inclusion, gives the perception that one or two administrators in our community can act unilaterally without public input against the position of a majority of the parents. And I think you guys can see that because your intent in the beginning of the school year was to remain unmasked inside the classrooms. Uh, the reason for this specific section of the policy is so that parents are included as a part of their, uh, as an integral part in their child's physical, and, and I'd like to emphasize what was said earlier, social and emotional development journey, not just the physical aspect. And by disallowing public input from parents and not doing the vote in a board setting, you're also denying us the transparency required when considering who to vote for in future school board elections. The, the school board elections are the only way we can hold you guys accountable for you know, making sure that the majority of parents have a say in the school. And, and that's, um, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Walker. All right, Wendy Brand. Wendy? Hi, Wendy, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Welcome to the Twilight Zone. Yes, it is still American land of the free and home of the brave, but it's hard to see this because the wool has been slowly pulled over our eyes and many of us have fallen prey to the pseudoscience and propaganda of past and the, of the current administration, this board included. Think art of distraction, it's industrial strength propaganda. To borrow a phrase from Professor Brett Weinstein, so corrupt as to be useless. You keep saying follow the science, but what you're really saying is we follow the money because your science is not science at all, but a fabrication to lead us astray by fear. Simply put, it's coercion, which is a, a crime under US code title 42 subchapter 3617. The facts are that these children, and especially K through six, are the least in danger of contracting or spreading this particular so-called virus. This is what we demand of you. We demand that you provide us with evidence that this virus has been isolated so as to prove its existence. Until then, no masks or vaccinations should be talked about, other than how to say that how dangerous they are for our children. Check the VAERS reporting system for the facts on this. Excuse me for the damage the vaccinations have already produced. Until then, we're putting full liability on you for the damage that has been done and is being done to our children. This is blatant child abuse. Under US Code 18, uh, subsection 1169, and under the Michigan uh, Code Light Law 38.1307B, the Revised School Code Act 451 of 1976, and you are required to report it, or it's a crime on your part. I will be reporting this. 
Stop being the tool the government uses to push this poison on people, and especially if it's regarding unsuspecting and innocent, naive children. Your sins and these crimes will not go unpunished. Do what's right and hand in your resi or hand in your resignation. We will not tolerate this evil any longer. You take your instructions from we the people, and we are instructing you to stand down, open the schools without these unproven and unscientific mandates, or we will remove you from this elected position, period. If you truly cared about these children, you'd be teaching and demonstrating proper and effective ways of building their immune system, their, rather than teaching them that their own bodies are not capable of fighting off a virus that has a 0.001% chance of harming them. That's indoctrination, not education. Teach them about the benefits of real whole foods and fruits and vegetables. Teach them about the true science of an innate immune system. Teach them that their health is their responsibility and their fit in their parents. Teach them that a healthy person does not need to fear unhealthy pathogens. We need a functional system of primary education, and this, dear sirs, is dysfunctional. When it becomes this corrupt, it is useless. Parents, I urge you to consider pulling your children and homeschooling them until a credible, functional, and truly educational system emerges. Be a part of the change you wish to see. I am not responsible for your immune system. You are not responsible for mine. It is way too complicated. That's just ridiculous. You will either do good or harm, either by action or inaction. This depends to some degree by who we think we are and what we're capable of. We are powerful beyond measure. Stand for something or fall for anything. It's your choice. God help us all. Thank you, Wendy. Rebecca Root. Good evening, Rebecca. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I am a mother of three children who attend Mid Midland Public Schools. I have two students at Plymouth and one at Midland High. I speak to you tonight about the mask mandate and why I feel you need to leave this to parents' choice. It should not be mandated for me from the health department what mitigation strategy works best for my children. Unvaccinated children are at a lower risk of COVID death than fully vaccinated adults. A September 10, 2021 article from Newsweek magazine states, there are three children under the age of 18 who died in England within 28 days of testing positive for COVID-19 out of a total of 167,832 cases. While in the same time frame, an 18 to 29 year old, there were 18 deaths and 30 to 39 year olds suffered 45 deaths over a three week span. As of September 14th, there were only seven pediatric COVID hospitalizations in the state of Michigan. The pediatric population in Michigan is 2,884,065. Mr. Sharo, have you or Mr. Yarnowski spent any time or money personally studying the long-term effects of universal masking on our children? Have you studied the effects on their speech development, their mental health, their breathing, their anxiety disorders, asthma, sensory processing disorders, just to name a few. I think it's safe to say you haven't studied it. The NIH had a $41.7 billion budget for the fiscal year 2020, which ends on September 30th, 2021, and they haven't studied it either. Yet we take the choice away from the parent who knows the child best on if the child should wear a mask. Do you know if the child has any of those conditions? Mr. Sharo, as an elected official of the school board, you have a responsibility to the, revi to the revised school code of Michigan. In that code, section 380.10 states, it is the natural fundamental right of the parent and the legal guardian to determine and direct the care, teaching, and education of their children. The public schools of the state serve the needs of the people by cooperating with the pupil's parent and legal guardian to develop the pupil's intellectual capabilities and vocational tools in a safe and positive manner. Furthermore, the revised school code section 380.1307A shall include a clear statement of all of the following practices that are prohibited for school personnel in the public schools of the state under all circumstances, including an emergency. 
situation. The statement prohibits practice. Any restraint that negatively impacts breathing should not be used. Have you tried to breathe in a mask with allergies? My son gets in trouble because he pulls it down because it's allergy season and he can't breathe. I want thank, to tell thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Root. Thank you. I want to tell you're, you one more thing. Ma'am, your time is up. But this is important, and I want you to hear it. Listen, your time's up. Everybody's got the same allocation of time. I, I'm trying to be flexible a little bit with everybody. But you need to hear how your administrator treated me this morning. I'm going to tell you what happened at the school. Please, morning. enough. I, I don't want to get into argument with you. Your time is up. Return to your seat. Thank you. Jacob Lewis. Good evening, Mr. Lewis. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. The floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you for the time, finally. Uh, my name is Jacob Lewis. I am a respected business owner in Minden, Michigan. I have four children that are currently attending MPS. I hold a national certification with the IR IICRC in viral and bacterial mitigation, as well as multiple certifications with Michigan State Agriculture, including fungal control and mitigation. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to finally speak after multiple um, asks of, uh, of uh, an emergency meeting, which was denied. Um, I would like to address the mask mandate enforced on September 1st. If masks on children K through six are allegedly to prevent community spread, as uh, one of these physicians had said earlier, uh, it's odd to me that MPS, uh, the explanation for the mandate is due to vaccines being unavailable to this specific age group. So those two things don't match up, but that's kind of a question, I guess. I'm one of many concerned parents here tonight. I personally uh, am not as concerned with masks or vaccines as much, but more so with the people we appointed to make important decisions for the well-being of, of all of our children attending Midland Public Schools and the overstepping of authority that is taking place involving medical decisions and equipment being forced and mandated on our children in order for them to participate in public school with no input from parents. In my opinion, based on my own findings and knowledge of mitigation, this mandate is no more than a political move of advancement and a chance to enhance funding to this administration, as you can see from the last year audit presentation we just witnessed, actually. Uh, this mandate is a direct attack on our children, our human rights, the Constitution, state legislature, and strips us of our God-given freedoms as American citizens, and we will not allow it. We demand parents' choice on this matter. So. Why is there such a lack of communication on the superintendent's part? I understand his position comes with a hard decision, and he very well may be doing the best of his ability. The problem is that the way of all of this was handled. In his, in his position, knowing the division of beliefs on the topic in this community, right here, as you can see, based on false information given to both sides, he should have examined all possible mitigation and, and control procedures, called an emergency board meeting to explain the situation to the, public re to the public representation, which is the board, and conduct a vote for us to have the say. His position requires a transparency of communication, and that was not given. It seems like a public service in a public uh, service position of his measure, public input, communication, and parents' views, opinions should be top priority as a preventative tactic to ensure the best results in all decisions made. We all, we have been, uh, why, oh, so now some questions. Why have we been denied an emergency board meeting on this topic since the first? Multiple hundreds of emails, why? Why have we been denied? Question, okay, Where, where's the access to the historical uh, MPS COVID information from last year? Why can't we find it? Why isn't it there? Why can't we compare to the numbers of this year? Why is there no remote learning option for the people who are too afraid to send their kids to school without masks? Why hasn't the school done a survey on COVID measures but decided to do one on the DEI curriculum? Okay, talk about diversity. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I may butcher this last name, and I apologize. I, yeah, I'm having a hard time reading. Melissa Shavaster, Shav is that right? I'm sorry? Okay. This is spelled C-H-E-V-A-S-T-E-R. Am I, am I, I apologize, I'm sorry. Okay.
Good evening. Thanks for joining us. The floor is yours. I'll start and just let you know the discussion of the week. So I'm going to be reading the letter that her dad, Dr. Sporty, had sent in for her to read. We were told we can't do that. We were told that. Uh, I'm sorry. I said Rachel Buckman had to leave. She's on the list. Okay. Her dad is Dr. Scorey, Okay. And he had sent a letter for us to read to you guys. If you can get in within your three minute allotment, that's fine, but you only get three minutes. Okay. Okay. Sir, come on. Please, the floor is yours. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I mean, my name is Melissa. I'm a mother of three students currently here in Midland Public Schools. I have a son in fourth grade, a son in eighth grade, and a son in twelfth grade. I also have two daughters that have graduated from Midland Public Schools, and I'm also a graduate myself. Um, my son was part of the outbreak at Adam. We were very vigilant on our efforts to try to keep our kids safe. Um, all of our family is vaccinated. We all wear masks when we are in public. Um, unfortunately, you know, my son wore a mask to go to school and still caught it because there was only three students in his class wearing one. In his class, there was about 20 students plus the teacher that ended up getting COVID. Um, he also brought it home to my husband who was vaccinated and had to miss 10 days of work and had to take vacation pay in order to get pay. Um, you know, I just want, I guess, the board to understand that how important this is. And, you know, for us, obviously, you know, I'm not as concerned about us bringing it home to our family anymore. But what I'm more concerned about is the rest of the children at the school that, you know, could be contagious and expose other children, and especially friends of mine like um, Kelly that has a son that just went through cancer treatment. I'm going to read the letter really quick that Dr. Sporey wrote. I'm going to try to get in as much as I can. To whom it may concern, I've spent the past 40 years of my life practicing medicine, and during that time, it has been my job to assess, diagnose, and treat my patients to the best of my ability within the scope of knowledge available to me at that time. I also give guidance to my patients to keep them healthy throughout their lives. When I was given the opportunity to give guidance to the parents and schools in this area, I felt an obligation to do so. Unfortunately, our knowledge of how to treat COVID is still very limited. We are still struggling to determine why some individuals become so ill while others barely have symptoms. We are fortunate to have several vaccines that drastically reduce the severity of COVID, but currently we are unable to vaccinate children under 12 years of age. As COVID cases rise in our state, we are seeing a dramatic increase in child cases. Schools that have mandated masks are seeing a greatly reduced instance not because masks protect the children from getting COVID, but from spreading it. Wearing a mask is a very simple thing to do. I myself wear one all day long in the clinic. I hear arguments from parents that it's taking an emotional toll on their children, but it appears to be more of a toll on the parents. The children accept it as a matter of fact. I saw more emotional stress from the children over virtual learning than having to wear a mask at school. If cases continue to rise, especially in schools, we likely will see an increase in virtual learning as well. I'm not gonna get through all of it, but I don't wanna keep you guys, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Melissa, Melissa, who, who was the, who did you mention that was a scheduled speaker that had left? Okay, okay, thank you very much. She was next. Mark Stewart. Good evening, Mr. Stewart. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. I come to you tonight, a father, two boys in Midland Public Schools. I have a fifth grader, I have a seventh grader. One of my biggest concerns that we've had so far with, with this mask mandate is the complete lack of training especially in the testing and the data involved. At one point, MTS website, the, the COVID, you know, contains a school name and information such as close contact, confirmed, probable, positive, and return date. Now it only shows a confirmed and a close contact. 
why they're changing the reporting. I don't agree that we necessarily need to have every probable case out there, but the information we're getting has been misleading from the beginning. Why were negative test results never mentioned at all? As much of us know now, the PCR rapid test used in schools have a high margin in error. Mr. Shero has claimed any such positive test would then be followed by a teacher test. I'm sure many of these tests came back as negative. However, the negative tests are not being reported. This is aiding in the spread of fear. Negative results need to be reported. Furthermore, how many positive cases came from schools with, from, from a close contact as the school, as that happened at the schools themselves? From one administrator that I personally talked to when my son went through the close contact protocol, he said it was zero in his school, zero. Why is that not being shared to the public? The COVID is not spreading in our schools. It is spreading in events outside of our schools. The lack of transparency is just not a problem here in Midland, but nationwide. In Michigan, we have a population of nearly 10 million people. According to Michigan.gov, there has been about 1.1 million cases of COVID and 21, 000, almost 22,000 deaths, and every death is tragic, no, no doubt. The Mayo, the Mayo Clinic puts the mortality rate here in Michigan at about 1.9%. Though all these deaths being tragic, COVID is rarely the lone case for these deaths. There's usually other factors involved. My own aunt died when, during COVID. She was also overweight, didn't take care of her health, had diabetes. COVID killed when other factors are involved. This unreported and misrepresented data is causing a divide in our community. Those of us who don't want our children in masks have been threatened had death threat, you know, death wished upon us and our children, and we've been yelled at. We've begun to have seen gestures and, and cursed at and, and threatened. And, and you know, we, we have another speaker to discuss those things. We are better than this. This is America. This is the land of the free because of the brave. And no more can one man overstep his bounds and decide to result for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Shane Bennett. Good evening, Mr. Bennett. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Hello. Uh, my name is Shane Bennett. My child attends Adams Elementary. Um, I have to say, I think the original mask optional policy for children was correct. Leave the medical decision about what's best for children to the experts, to the parents. How do I know? Because I asked my child how many kids wore their masks during the first week of school. He answered three or four. I think parents made their choice. No judgment, but I can't find any credible evidence that masks, especially cloth face coverings, work. We, re we regard any conceivable harm from COVID as presumptively real and worth mitigation, but any conceivable harm from the mitigation as an illusion, no matter how much evidence is available. To justify the continued masking of children with no one in sight, you have to prove to me that the masks have benefits and they are also worth the costs. At best, the science behind masking children is uncertain. There are plenty of studies, including the CDC's own of 90,000 elementary students in 169 schools in Georgia that show no statistical benefit of masking. Curiously, this important fact is buried several pages into the paper and absent from the executive summary. Additionally, the study also showed no benefit to other off-use measures, including distancing, hybrid models, and desk barriers. If we have any competing randomized controlled studies to show a benefit of masking, let's see them. Cloth masks are completely worthless, yet are still being recommended as equal to other masks. The majority of particles expelled during breathing and speaking are less than five microns, with a large portion less than one micron. There is no way elementary school kids are wearing well-fitting masks correctly. One study states that a 3.2% gap nearly eliminates all mask benefits to particles less than five microns. Another study shows that a two times per hour air change was more effective against spread than the best performing mask. 
Far from being without risk, masks have serious downsides. One study found that masks worn all day by students held pathogens that cause a variety of disease, including pneumonia, meningitis, and Legionnaire's disease. <clears throat> Can we admit that no other advanced Western country recommends masking children, is rarely recommended for those under 12, and never for those under 6? This includes the UK, Ireland, all of Scandinavia, France, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Italy, and the European equivalent of the CDC. Conspicuously, there is no evidence of increased spread in schools in these countries compared to the US. In fact, the masking of children differs from the guidance of the WHO itself, which explicitly recognizes the potential social and academic harms without a clear benefit. Finally, COVID, thankfully, is a vanishing small risk to children. I understand every death is a tragedy. As a 38-year-old vaccinated male man, uh, I have the same risk of severe COVID as my unvaccinated child. Through the end of July, CDC reported just 361 deaths under the age of 18 years old out of a population of 70 million. Compare that to 477 deaths from the much shorter 2018-2019 flu season, or even the 1,282 deaths from the swine flu in 2009-2010. Did we mask then, and why not? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Lisa Hansen. Good evening, Ms. Hansen. Good evening. Thank you for joining us and welcome back. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I just wanna say, first of all, I, for those of you all know this, but this is my seventh time in front of you in six months. Um, and it's been a very interesting journey and I had a speech prepared, but I, I, I also wanna say that um, I am really proud. I'm really proud of these parents for standing up and, and sharing facts and information that don't seem to come from the medical world. So I wanna just say this. There is a lot of information out there. Clearly, we're very divided and it's sad, but it is what it is. And nobody is saying, don't, you know, we're not saying that you can't wear masks. We're not saying that you can't vaccinate. We're just saying as parents, we want the choice. And so, <laughs> This is actually really simple. It's become a big thing, but it's really simple. It doesn't matter how much emotion and opinion is on the subject. Bottom line is we have rights. We have parental rights and you took an oath to the Constitution of the United States. You did not take an oath to the CDC. You did not take an oath to the health department. Your job is to stand up for parental rights. It is actually that simple. And I've been coming for six months I am on your side. I want to give you support. I appreciate where everybody's at in this room. Everyone is entitled to their opinion. And you can disagree with me. And I support that. And I respect that. But I'm entitled to my opinion. And as a parent, I get to decide. If your kid, I'll tell you what, if your kid does well with a, a mask on, you better count your blessings. Because you're one of the fortunate ones. That broad stroke does not apply to all these children. And it is only the parents that know what is best for their children. Six months ago, we had a gentleman here from Covenant over in Saginaw, and he was saying that uh, the suicide rate has not just increased, but it's become younger and younger children. They have had 11-year-olds in there trying to take their lives. How can we sit here and think that this is okay when these kids at 11 years old don't think it's worth living their lives? That is a problem. That is a huge problem. And we're all passionate about this. I get it. I get it. And you know, I wish that they were still here. I appreciated everything they had to say, but I'm here to tell you, I've been researching hours every single day for 18 months now, and there are a lot of respected doctors and scientists and immunologists and epidemiologists all over this world that disagree with everything they say. <laughs> You don't get to just pretend that parental rights are not a thing. We don't co-parent with the school board or the health department. The only way forward is choice. You need to give parents choice. It is actually that simple. And finally, let me remind everyone that our rights don't come from the government. They come from God. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hansen.
Melissa Buchek. I think you're our last Melissa. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Um, my name is Melissa. Um, I'm a mother of three. Um, I retired mechanical engineer turned stay-at-home mom. I just wanted to start by pointing out, if it's not already evident, that student health is a well-being uh, and well-being is multifaceted, which is why I believe a one-size-fix-all band-aid like a mask is not the best approach. I'm going to go back and reiterate some things that have already been said, but I think they're important and worth hearing again. The use of masks instead of ras respirators to block transmission of a virus for the general public was only authorized for experimental use. The FDA and OSHA have made it clear over the years that only respirators, not masks, are considered valid PPE to block transmission of a respiratory virus. As such, it should be optional. I specifically want to draw our attention to the disclaimer on nearly every store-bought mask. And as I can see here, there's 11 on this one, but I'm just gonna draw attention to one of them. Number four, not intended for antimicrobial or antiviral protection or related uses or uses for infection prevention or reduction or related uses. I bought this at Target today here in Midland. Personally, I've worked 10 years in the automotive industry as an engineer designing and testing products for the general public. The intended use is important. These words on this box have meaning. If the mass manufacturers can't legally sell these products without adding this label, what does this tell us? I, I challenge the Midland Public School Board to supply us a list of man, mass manufacturers that will stand behind their product's efficacy for the use you're intending it for, which is for a child to wear it eight hours plus a day. These, and these doctors that, that sat up here, have any of them been in a classroom and in our school district, in any school district, and seen the reality of the children wearing the masks? Furthermore, are we expecting teachers to lead the children in mask changing rituals? per the use of these, like every 30 minutes to 60 minutes? Are we, are we going to keep turning a blind eye to the improper use of masks just to give ourselves this false sense of security? All of this comes at a cost to our children. Our children and school staff deserve better. Furthermore, I'd like to remind you of why we're all here, for our children. Would you be proud if your child could see you now? If you're in the audience showing your cards of approval and disapproval, I ask you that you reflect on your actions. Do you want to teach your children that their voice doesn't matter, that if it doesn't align with yours or everyone else's, or that diversity of minds is bad, and that everything needs a rating? Shame on you. Melissa, thank you. Emily Brown. Good evening, Ms. Brown. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good evening. Thank you for being here, board. Uh, my name is Emily Brown. I have three boys, two of which are at Seabird Elementary. And I'm here tonight to respectfully share my opinion about the mask mandate. First of all, I want to recognize the common ground that we all share tonight, which is the well being of our children. And interesting enough, the well-being of our children looks a little different to each of us, and I believe that that's okay. Some think children need to wear masks, and others, like myself, do not want my child wearing a mask during the day. Some people do not believe in vaccines, while I myself am fully vaccinated. Our beliefs and opinions are formed by our experiences and the people that surround us. So for my family, ours come from my husband and I, I'm a former teacher, I have a master's in early childhood education, and my husband is an emergency physician. And our beliefs for our children stem in deep roots in God and family, a large respect for education, and a great humility and gratefulness for good.
good health. My husband is also a Navy veteran and current captain in the active Army Reserve, and he has sacrificed his safety and time away from his family to ensure that our freedom of choice is intact. His service allows for everyone in this room to show cards and to come up to this podium and voice their opinion. But it does not, his service and his sacrifice does not allow for our rights to be taken away from our children. I believe COVID has truly polarized the view of health in the past 19 months, and I feel like we've forgotten how to coincide as individuals while still maintaining respect of difference of opinion. And even though they are small, our children are watching us, and they're watching how we deal with this conflict. So I'm asking you, the board, to place that risk and that choice where it should be back on our families, off your shoulders and back to us, because we should be able to choose what is best for our children. We should be able to choose the level of risk we feel comfortable with. And as the board, you have so many other important tasks that are overshadowed now with this mass mandate and with the COVID. And while we appreciate you thinking of the safety of our children, we elected you to ensure that our children receive the best education possible, that you continue to support our amazing teachers and principals in their efforts to teach the multifaceted curriculum in which shape our children socially, emotionally, academically, in ways as parents, we can't. So I'm asking you to focus on the common ground which we all have while acknowledging my husband's service and sacrifice and let us exercise our right to choose. Before we continue with our, our list, um, Ms. Brown, thank you for sharing your husband with our country. Uh, is, is he standing or sitting next to you? Thank you, sir. I am also reminded that given the time, um, I will need a motion to extend our meeting. Uh, so I don't know to what time we're... Well, set it, set it long so you don't have to... Yeah, I would set it, so I, would say, say at least 10, I would say 10, 15, 10, 30. We have, uh, we've got six more, six more speakers and then the rest of our... The business should be relatively quick. We're down to five. Ten fifteen for now. Let, let's go. Let's go ten fifteen. Make a motion to extend the board meeting until ten fifteen. Support. Motion by Mr. Rausch. Support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposition? None. Thank you very much. We are extended. Okay, moving on. You're quite welcome. James Sheets. Good evening, Mr. Sheets. Thank you for joining us, sir. The floor is yours. Thanks for letting me talk tonight, guys. Um, I'm a father of three girls. Um, I'm a local business owner. Um, and I work closely with a lot of local physicians and a lot of big names in medical history and uh, medical fields in, uh, in, in this area. Um, and when the whole mask mandate come down on September 1st, which was kind of appalling on a Saturday night, and I had no idea about it come Monday morning, because who reads those emails? I thought it was just another something, something or rather. Um, but here we are, I was told that it was only going to be two weeks. And here we are, I mean, what are we, three weeks into this? And I don't normally come to these things, but you know, when my had a little bit of event with my six-year-old daughter here this last week, who goes to attends Woodcrest with a little bit of a panic attack, wearing masks in her classroom, and you know what your guys' result was to that? Send her to the office. Okay? There was no protocols put in place, nobody talked with her. 
I don't know what happened. I had to deal with this um, when I picked her up from school, which I don't agree with. Um, I am my child's sole own protector, and when she's put in somebody else's hands like that and not protected in a way that I see you guys fit to do or what your job is, that's a problem for me, okay? Yeah. So that's, I want you guys to be that person for me. Yeah, you need to be that role, and I am losing faith in that very quickly, okay? Because now two weeks has turned into three weeks, three weeks is gonna turn into four weeks. When is enough enough, okay? When is it going to end? All right, you told me two weeks, am I wrong? You can nod, you don't have to answer. You told me two weeks, and we're not there. You changed that with no email or whatever the heck you guys want to do. So, I mean, the whole man hate thing is, it, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous that you get to choose a medical decision for my daughter. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. If you want that decision, John, as I see your computer is pretty important today. If you wanna, if you wanna fill out some child uh, uh, forms to take financial responsibility for my daughter, well, you want every other weekend, you want one weekend, once a month, okay? Let's get some money from them. But until then, my choice is my choice. And it's not yours, okay? So my, my point being, being a father of three daughters, and then also, matter of fact, I'm, I'm a brother to three uh, other brothers <laughs> uh, who have served this country very extensively. A total of 13 tours of duty, okay? In Afghanistan and Iraq. And I proudly served in different veterans groups and helped these people. I jump out of airplanes with these guys that have do these kinds of things. So when these guys did what they did for us to do this, and it sickens me that I have to deal with this yeah. on a weekly basis, and I refer to it as a face diaper, okay? Because you are literally making my daughter wear a piece of cloth on her face, and you think it's going to protect other people, which is absolutely absurd. Thank you, Mr. Sheets. William Zablocki, are you still with us? And did you want to speak tonight? Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a name, is it Cataline? I don't have a last name. I apologize, Catalina. I'll be very brief. My father, who was a rocket scientist, always told me, don't believe everything you read. I would modernize that quote to say, and don't believe everything you see on television. You may hear the words, trust the science. We've heard that so many times, right? I agree with that, but which science are we to trust? For instance, does wearing a mask really help you to avoid getting a virus? The science indicates that wearing a mask may do more harm than good, and improper use might increase the risk for transmission. According to a CDC Emerging Infectious Diseases study in 2020, the authors state that they found no significant reduction in pandemic influenza transmission with the use of face masks. Now that's a CDC study. And it's, uh, if you wanna look it up, it's called Non-Pharmaceutical Measures for Pandemic Influenza in Non-Healthcare Settings, Personal Protective and Environmental Measures, Volume 26, Number 5, May 2020. If masks don't reduce virus transmission, what are we doing to our young students by requiring them to wear masks during the school day? It's my opinion that we're teaching them to be afraid, actually afraid. These are small children we're talking about. They're not teenagers, they're not college students, they're small children and you have the responsibility, yes, you do, to protect those children, but is forcing them to wear a mask protecting those children? 
I would say no. And science actually says no as well, given the CDC report. So do your research. Do your own research. It only takes about an hour to find these actual CDC documents uh, online. It's very easy to do. If there is such a tiny risk to our children, why would we ask them to cover up their faces, which interferes with their ability to breathe and to communicate? Masks hide their smiles, muffle their laughter, and reduce their ability to speak clearly and to be understood easily, all for a virus that for them has about a 99% recovery rate. And by the way, when those wonderful physicians were up there speaking, they all had masks on. I had a very difficult time understanding what they were saying. So can you imagine what those children are doing in classrooms? Absolutely trying to communicate and it comes off muffled. How can they learn that way? Please leave the decision about mask wearing to the parents. That's where it belongs. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Egham, e Egan Egham, I'm, I'm sorry, Egan, is that correct? I'm sorry, ma'am. Welcome and thank you. The floor is yours. Hi, I'm Chris Egan, and I am uh, a member of this community. My question tonight is, what happened to common sense? All I see is people arguing back and forth, mask this, oh, we gotta put the mask on, we gotta, we gotta spike, oh no, you can take them off now, oh wait, we gotta put them back on. So this back and forth is just not the way to go. We need to really help the people in our community. You had a panel of experts up here, but where was the industrial engineer? Where were the doctors that don't agree with these doctors giving you the information that they have? Why can't we listen to that? Why can't we look at other options to help keep the children healthy? What happened to things like vitamin C? What happened to the keeping their immune system healthy? We need to have those things in place. As someone who had to wear that mask for work seven hours a day, it was horrible. My allergies this spring, I have never had allergies that bad before. It was just horrible for me. I couldn't wait to just rip that mask off at the end of the day. I can't imagine what these kids are going through. And not only that, but they have to have these big plexiglass things in front, which I have at my work, hate them. We need to have a little bit more common sense. We need to look at what are some other options that we can do to help keep these children healthy. Why do I have to go online and read that the government of El Salvador is giving everybody a COVID care package? that includes vitamin C, ivermectin. Why can't we do something like that for our kids? If a child goes home sick, why, why send all the other children home that might have gotten it? We don't know. I don't trust any of these tests that have been going on. That's the kind of thing that we need to look at. Why can't we send a little care package home with those kids that may have a potential um, contact? We don't know. These tests are are dangerous, some of these. I don't want to have somebody sticking something up my nose. It's, to me, that's about the same as you taking that swab and wiping it across a glass bottle that's been sitting on the ground. We literally live in a sea of viruses and bacteria. We need to strengthen our immune systems, not put masks on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Egan.
Kurt, I'm having a hard time reading your last name. I apologize for that. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Thank you for joining us. All right, good evening. My name is Kurt Boheis. I'm a Midland resident with a child enrolled in elementary school here in the district. I'm part of a large group of concerned parents, just a few of us here, and wanted to address kind of two brief points this evening. So first, that parents' opinions should have a material impact uh, on the policies of this district. And second, that genuine debate and dialogue will greatly improve the decisions that we make as a community. So to start, parents' opinions should matter. There's been a lot of sentiment woven into some of the communications and responses with both the board and the superintendent that kind of state that public opinion shouldn't really be impacting this matter when it comes to the mandate of masks. If you truly believe this, you'd also have to believe the following, that elected officials should flat out neglect feedback from their constituents. You'd also have to believe that everybody unanimously agrees on all aspects of the masking discussion, everything from the science to the philosophical value judgments and underpinning, that, that's underpinning it. I've also seen that when we go to do a typical conventional cost-benefit analysis, most of the COVID mitigation discussions revolve just around the benefits, right? It has 30 to 80% chance of, of reducing spread, um, maybe some other issues, but um, we don't talk about, you know, the, when you look at our mitigation policies overall, how much it discourages students to maybe interact with students in another class uh, or reach out, meet new people, along with um, all the other conditions that have been mentioned. Since it's obviously true, that elected officials should listen to their constituents and that there's still much to debate, uh, feedback from parents should be vital in making the right decision. This leads me to my second point. Genuine debate and dialogue will greatly improve our, dis our decisions. So I've watched several of these meetings online. This is the first one that I've attended. And the format heavily encourages individuals to talk past one another. So somebody comes up here and shares their point, somebody else does the same thing. Um, there's not a lot of dialogue between, let's say, opposing viewpoints, but also between us and the board and the superintendent. So I talk to you guys, and you sit there and maybe smile or maybe nod or, or no response at all. And so I, my ask would be that we change the format of this component of the meeting or potentially set up an additional meeting that allows for some more genuine discussion to help drive towards what really matters. I think you've got a room full of people that are all very well intentioned um, on, on both sides of the room tonight. Everybody wants what's best for the kids. Uh, but I think we could endorse a better format for the flow of ideas that'll help us get to a, a better policy. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Okay, our final speaker tonight, Sarah Radwin. Did I pronounce that correctly? Radwin. Hi, Sarah. Good evening. Hey, I'm going to keep it real short. I know everyone wants to go home. Um, I just want to be honest. I didn't want to come again tonight. Uh, been coming almost as long as Lisa. And I'm starting to feel like I am not talking to anyone who's actually listening. And I would like to reiterate what the last gentleman said is, perhaps it is the format that we have here. You state right up front you're not going to answer us. You state that you're going to respond to us in email. Doesn't ever happen. Right. Um, so I, I do. I feel like I'm standing here wasting my breath. I'm nervous. My mouth is dry every time I do this. I don't want to do it. But like another young lady spoke earlier, I do have one son who struggles, really, really struggles with these masks. And so I get over myself, over my fear, my anxiety, even my fear of inadequacy that I cannot communicate well with you. For him. I would like for you all to be looking at all of these speakers. They all have valid things to say. And really all we're asking is for that choice for us. Um, somebody mentioned three students in their class that actually were wearing masks. I respect the parents and those students who've made those choices. 
but you have to respect the other 95, 90% who decided not to. They're all your constituents also. Um, and that's, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I've, there's been some great data that's been presented by other people, I don't have to do that tonight. So um, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I really, really would like some more interaction with you folks. I'd like to know that you hear us and you, you take our opinions into account. And when we ask you questions, I would love to know that those answers, maybe, a for, maybe there's an email with a list of the questions that the parents have asked where you all can actually address it and send it back to everyone here or publish it in the communique or something so that we know you hear us and understand our concerns. Thank you, have a good night. Thank you. Okay, 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 okay. All right. Mr. Zabaki, thank you. Okay, that is the end of our public comment section. We are we don't have any more listed speakers. Um, I'm sorry. I sent a note up there to Thank you for bringing that to our attention, ma'am. Thank you for bringing it to our attention, ma'am. Okay, next up we have item 5.1. This is finance facilities and operations. Uh, this is gonna be study committee, committee minutes from September 7th, 2021. And folks, before we get into that, um, we can take a brief break and allow the, uh, anybody who wants to leave to go ahead and do so now. It's a uh, finance facilities and operations study committee minutes. Forty-five seconds. Uh, John's got to read the minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're we're gonna we should be done relatively quickly. He's just letting him leave, and then we'll finish Thank you. the meeting. Thank you. Is that the question, sir? So we're just letting everyone leave, and then we're gonna finish the meeting. Thank you.
30 seconds. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, continue on. Uh, Mr. Blatterbach, can you proceed with the minutes? Yes, thank you. On September 20th, it's the 2021 FSA annual meeting and discussion for the coming audit. And Mr. Youngson will be involved in the IEO and be presenting some of the uh, audit business committee packages into the various sections of the audit report, such as fund balance, financial statements, the single audit, the bond board, and the governor's communication. The audit proclaimed an unmodified opinion, which is also known as a clean audit. Mr. Dombro from Parker Mallow, uh, new construction management staff for the summer of 2022 to 2023 school year. Bid savings will extend the work beyond uh, current contractual regulations necessitating extended service agreement. We also reviewed the July and August financials. The July and August financials will be presented, or, uh, will be presented at the October Board of Education meeting. This is the traditional practice at NPS to do year end reporting and focus on the audit. We discussed the Northwest HVAC uh, project. The bid process will begin soon to install air conditioning on the first floor of Northwest Middle School. The project will likely need to include extensive electrical upgrades. We discussed, finally, we discussed the Old Harmless Millage, the new state budget, change the method of how Old Harmless districts are funded. The change shifts a portion of the responsibility of the millage to the school aid fund. This rule modification will result in a lower levy of the NPS taxpayers than was previously calculated. Corresponding resolutions will be brought to the September Board of Education. The next FFO meeting will be Monday, October 4th at 5 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Lauterbach. Uh, next up, we have item 5.2. This is information only regarding gifts. Mr. Bruton. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. As you mentioned, this is information only. It does not report your action this evening. Um, on the agenda listed are, are gifts from six different donors, totaling $6,500. The gifts range from classroom magazines in Chestnut Hill to multiple contributions to the Northeast Robotics Clubs. Um, all of these gifts will be acknowledged in board correspondence and also on our broadcast credits. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have item 6.1, Human Resources. This is an action item. This is the Masespa Fall 2021 Tentative Agreement. Mr. Bruton. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. Um, we bring to you for your consideration um, an extension on our contract with Masespa. This spring the contract was due to expire. Um, after vetting our opinion on the matter with FFO, we decided to enter contract talks this fall instead of waiting until this spring. And we are happy to report that we came to an amicable agreement very quickly. And we're bringing to you tonight a proposal that would shift the current wages of 2122 by a dollar. Thank you, Brian. Um, I will accept the motion regarding item 6.1. Make the motion to approve um, the SESPA contract for fall 2021 as presented by Mr. Bruton. I have support vote. A motion by Mr. Uh, Rausch, support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any further discussion regarding item 6.1? So Brian, are you looking for a can you please communicate what M SESPA is? Yeah, it is the trade. group that represents our grounds and trades professionals. That's Thank right. you. You're welcome. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next is item 7.1. This is correspondence to and from the Board of Education. Uh, we have information only. This is letters uh, from the Board of Education to a number of individuals identified um, in the agenda. Item 7.2 is information only. This is letters to the Board of Education from uh, Smart Procure, which is a FOIA request. Uh, item 8.1 is a list of our remaining meetings for 2021. 
and it also includes the following dates, tentative until approved at the January 10, 22 organizational meeting. Uh, those are also itemized in the agenda under 8.1. Uh, finally, that will bring us to our study discussion session. And um, are there any portions, parts of this meeting that need to be clarified uh, or further discussed before we turn the floor over to Mike? In your FFO minutes, we had a Bartonello memo to staff in the meeting to talk about summer of 22 through 23 school year. Um, we have good savings. We have uh, series one is 100% done. My number two now is Mr. John Hanger. Uh, 56% done on two and 0% on three. So roughly we've got $28 million worth of work on the schedule. I don't know if that includes bond savings or whatever. We've got quite a bit left to do. Um, Actually, I, s I got corrected, Brad. Yep. So that was out of the audit, which was done on um, June 30. And so the bulk of our work occurs during the summer. And so Series 2 um, is basically spent as well. Um, and so between, uh, between the, well, mainly Series 2 and any bid savings and interest we've earned, um, it's approximately $4 million that we have left to do it. Series 3, is, if you recall, is predominantly um, technology and busing. Which yeah. could be reviewed. About eight or nine million. From yeah. Series three. Yeah. So it's not quite that because the auto part trails and so much of it's spent during the summer. Just like the site logic report showed, I don't remember thirty percent. We're we're way past that. So we'll get you we'll get you an update next FFO meeting and bring it here. But it's it's further than that. Yeah. And the the staffing contract will be coming to you next month. We feel we still need to, need that uh, assistance as we go with four million. Mike's department is really just Mike, once much larger department, and on top of the amount of capital money we're putting into our projects that he manages, he bids, he de helps with design, I think we need to keep that portion of it. And so they've got a scaled down staffing plan, and then your French associates is a fee as you go, and so they don't necessarily need a new one. But the Barton Mallon contract's up, done. What is it, now or at the end of the year? Or? If I recall it. It, it's got like a trailing, so the work's done through the summer, but they trail maybe th to December, but it's basically over with. Okay. And then air conditioning that you mentioned for North Beach. Yeah, so. Which, we, which bucket is that plan for? Is that. So you have to be decided because we're going to bring it to you. We, we believe we probably could use some of the ESSER dollars. So if you remember, some of the ESSER dollars can be used air filtration and HVAC. And so we've done so much of that work uh, already through the bond, so much of our air is being filtered, the amount of fresh air being brought in. I think it's one of the reasons we do tend to have low incident rates in our school, but Northeast is behind. So we did the splits through capital on the second floor. The last ones are being done. You know that um, right about now, right, being done. And then um, the, the main floor, we think we go ahead and do it all in one shot instead of stages. A um, couple points there. One, if that building really does come offline in 10 years, you've got your full investment of those split units because that's about the life of the units. Okay. And then the second one is um, we have, think we have the funds. And as you know, and I'm talking in your area, so you probably know this a little more. We need, one of the reasons we didn't do all of it at the time is we need new switch gear transformers come to, to get the power into the building that they cannot bring the amount of power there into the building, so we would bid that as well. It's on our side, <clears throat> and I'm talking a little bit on my field. You and Phil may know that better than me, but there's equipment we have to purchase in there to bring equipment that's on our side. Okay, all right. Um, and I don't know if you're gonna address this in, in your... I'm, I'm actually gonna not say any comments unless I have to because I okay. wanna save your night. All right. Um, So I would, I would say to you that um, um, we certainly can look at 
typically when you have a normal board meeting where you get a couple comments, we follow up with an email. What you heard out there today, it's pretty difficult to follow up with individual emails. And there wasn't a lot of questions, it was more comments for you. It was more listening anyway. But I, I think um, in these formats, and all, if you watched it, and I've tried to pass that along to you, this is not an MPS's issue, this is across the country issue on these issues that occurred. And you know, as many as people here that would say <clears throat> that it was it's um, one-sided, it's not. And I've shared recently some of the state polling, it's not one-sided, we're so divided down the road. You can't hold a finger up right now and say, should we mask or not mask by popularity? You got two sides of that, every opinion on that. So I, I would sit here and say, someone who's done this for a damn long time, that there's not a right or wrong on this thing. And I've said it all along, and, and we've tried to give parent choice as long as we can um, through this. And personally, I'd like to return to parent choice as fast as we can. I don't know when that is. And we talked to the experts on all that. And most of them would say our rationale that vaccines are available at the secondary level when that occurs. If you have a choice to vaccine and you have a choice to, to mask, then maybe it's time to return to full choice. I don't think most people want to hear it could be December on elementary before that. So maybe this thing burns out like everyone's saying. I think one of the doctors mentioned, and I've heard that multiple times from doctors, <clears throat> that this, this is a fast burning virus and it may be burned down in October. But I can't tell you, and I'm not an expert on this either. And so I sit here and I listen to all this and I try to listen to all the comments and all the different studies. As John said, I think I've read every study there is out there and I've taken every one of them to as many experts to try to figure out what's right, what's not. And it's, it keeps coming back to, you know, CDC, they quote CDC studies, and you got CDC also, the one that's recommending this that we put masks on kids. Uh, it's, I, I'm telling you, the school superintendent who's sitting here for a long time, you wanna be frustrated, I'm as frustrated as anybody else. And by the way, I don't believe this should be our decision. It's the health experts that have passed this on and threw, it, threw us into this. I'm very frustrated about that, have been since COVID started. And so um, I don't think there's a right or wrong or a way to communicate that, Brad, I really don't. Um, I, 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 I will try to, I wrote down today, um, we'll try to answer some of these in the communique, kind of mask the FAQ. We did put some FAQs out. If you saw that, we'll do it again. We are gonna put some FAQs out that CRT isn't public school DEI and, that, and people need to read that and stop that one too, because that's not that piece of it. So I will, we all will try to do that. We talked about the communication. Brian and Jeff did a podcast on it. They're doing another podcast on it. Remember, this is all in three or four weeks. This has all occurred. So I, I get it, what you're saying, and, I, and I'll take your feedback. But man, I, I, I don't think anyone's ever seen a time period like this. And, and every superintendent, every school board I've talked to has said, this year, this year is worse than last year. Lack of direction from Michigan Department of Health and Services, lack of direction from our governor, lack of direction in the dysfunction in the state government, dysfunction in our federal government. It, it occurred and you guys are now the blunt, blunt of all of that occurring going on. And so it's very, very frustrating on all of it going forward. So um, again, 33% of all school board members have resigned in the last two months. Last spring, 30% of all school superintendents retired or resigned. This is a difficult time to be in this. So I'll take your feedback, but I don't know that there's a one perfect thing, answer. Uh, Go ahead, no, I'm done. So one of the things that I, I think maybe would be helpful is to have Troon give us advice on the information side. Because my understanding, I don't profess all the expertise on it. My understanding has always been is that the way the Open Meetings Act work is, works is that we publish an agenda and we tell the public, here's what we're going to talk about. Correct. Here. And under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen, any member of the public has the right to come to the meeting. Address the Whether it's a school board or a township or city council or whatever, planning commission, you name it, and, and address the board. If we start to deliberate, if we start to have a dialogue about something that's not on the agenda, something that if we respond to public comment, right. we've now started deliberating over something that we didn't put on the agenda, that we didn't tell the public we were gonna talk about. So then some other member of the public might say, well, wait a minute, if I'd known you were gonna talk about that, I would have come to the meeting and I would have expressed my opinion. So by deliberating with the public at the meeting, you've now violated the Open Meetings Act. Yes. So we have to be, I think, and I, I, I yes. would like to get through to give it. us advice on this, to, to, because my understanding has been that's why we don't engage, mm -hmm. because we're now starting
starting to deliberate about matters that we shouldn't be. Michigan Association of School Boards, Truman, all will tell you, your meeting is a business meeting of the board that's open for the public observation. In that meeting, you, you, are allow, you allow public comment to address the board. It is not a dialogue on your, your business. All that, you guys are supposed to be out getting that feedback as you go, coming in, and, and you're, the, you're the representatives of the community to make that choice. And so um, that, that's how that, that is supposed to occur. It's a meeting of the board, open to the public, not a public meeting for open dialogue. Furthermore, that's why I don't think it's supposed to be signed because it's by all with, with the Yeah, it, very for difficult. The same reason that we're then deliberating in a private conversation yep. over email, which is equally. So Cindy and I, Cindy and I try to do as much as that you can during these times where we've had high incidents uh, of that the volume is somewhat overwhelming, and then when you do send out a, somewhat of a generic one answer to the whole situation, people don't like that either, and so it's it's very difficult. And so I, I think we've done some FAQs. I think we've done the podcast and response. We've done several pieces of it. Somebody mentioned like an open forum, and if you've watched any of those in the state, they have not been good. And so, um, but I, I think it would they, be they helpful in addressing the concern because there's a perception that we're not transparent, that we're not responsive, and if people understood that there are reasons why it appears that way that we can't do anything about, it, yep. I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I think well, some know. of the transparency on data, it's actually there. I think somebody mentioned that it's still not there in the school. By school, it is, and it, but the format changed this year because of the quarantine rules. And so this year with the testing options and material testing pieces of that. And so there, there's just so many categories to have tried to say, hey, you know, this parent chose to stay in school as a quarantine and test, and this parent chose not to, and this parent did not. And so the recommendation, and by the way, there's a law that says all you have to do is report your positive cases. We report more than most school districts do. And that's hence why the Midland Public our Midland Daily News quotes us and none of the other districts because we post all ours and we post it daily. And so um, it's there, total number of cases, total number of close contacts are there. If you go down by the building, it's there as well. It just changed as the health department provides that number to us, they changed how they collected that data. We have the three new R HRA nurses on, on site now to, that run that data and we just simply post it off of it. So that's part of it as well. well you know, we can continue to work on it. I think. Bottom line is um, the answers that we can give right now, and you got 30, 40 percent on each side that aren't going to like them. I mean, you've, had, you've heard just as many people say, what, "Why the hell aren't you masking K-12?" Everybody, and then as many it, to give During them the choice. During the we got an email saying exactly that. Yeah. So why aren't you doing universal K-12? Yeah. And I was strong stands all over. Yeah, so we did answer that one with Dr. Bodner's. We had her answer that, so the recall tests that have nothing to do with ours. Okay. And um, our, the, the test that we used, um, Dr. Bodner and Fred told the study, it's 97% accurate, but they do, sh they, they do require, um, a, if a parent particularly wants to do, um, go through the protocol, they, they do require the uh, next level test. PCR test as well to do that. And so when they said there's false positives, um, I'm unaware of any of our um, on-school sites ever being a false positive that we've done. And Jeff, you would agree, Jeff kind of handles those tests. So I'm unaware of any of those uh, doing that, so. And we answered that in as many emails as we could because Dr. Bodner provided us a real na nice answer. I raised the question on the serial testing and the PCR testing and all that when, when that was asked. And so, and we'll, I think we, and I'll go back and look at that. I thought we did an FAQ on that. So I'll go back, I think it's still there. But that's what I think after this one, if I'll update the FAQs on what I heard, we'll post the link in the next communique as well. And if I miss something, we'll add more to it, right? Okay. But I believe we did that right after the, the first announcement, like a few days after that. Correct, I think John Hatfield asked for it. I remember now. Yep. Yep. Yes, sir. 
All right. I will take a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Roush. Fourth. Second by Mr. Lauterbach. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around tonight. We appreciate you.